Okay, so uh, it's one o'clock this Monday afternoon and we'd like to say very, very welcome to AI Sweden and to this Talent Day. It's actually the second Talent Day and today might be an historical event because we are hoping that this will actually be one of the last online events that we'll have here in Sweden since the restriction opens up everything or, or they will all disappear on, on Wednesday. I'm Niklas Fock. I work as head of talent programs within AI Sweden and by my side I have Ivana von Proswitz. Yes, exactly. My name is Ivana von Proswitz and I am program manager for the i for ai talent program. And we'll come back to that during the day, but you and I will be moderating this uh, day and we are super happy uh, and excited to meet you all out there. And we also have a schedule with some amazing persons that we will come back to. Now, to s just to start off, I'd like to say a few words about AI Sweden and who we are. So AI Sweden is a national initiative that has been uh, in the air, so to say, for like three years. Uh, we are an organization that is only purely working for the acceleration of applied AI in all the Swedish society. So uh, we have small uh, partners, we have startups, we have huge multinational corporates, we have public, we have private partners and we have academia and institutes. So uh, all this uh, builds up a very big and uh, uh, nice and super attractive and fantastic uh, ecosystem for AI. Now, uh, we are not here for ourselves. So AI Sweden is purely here for you as our partners. And this day today we'll address partner issues around attracting talent. So uh, how do you do this and how do we work within AI Sweden? Well, we have four pillars and we uh, as you can see, we're working a lot with different kinds of partner networks to engage you partners into the ecosystem. We're working with talents, obviously. Uh, we work a lot with different kinds of shareable knowledge and shareable resources. We have a data factory. We would work with AI transformation, for instance. But maybe, uh, and that's most difficult, but most important, we also have the leadership part that uh, we address more and more to, because we realize that working with AI and transforming organizations into becoming AI mature organizations, we need a firm leadership and we, knew, we need a new kind of leadership. I hope we will come back to that also during the day today. Hmm. So Ivana, uh, what could we expect from the day? Oh, we can expect a fantastic day and we really want to open up uh, around questions around talents, recruiting talents, retaining talents, upskilling ta talents. What is a talent? What can we expect? What is the future of talents? So we, are, we have invited very uh, exciting and very uh, knowledgeable people in the field today to join us uh, in our, as our keynote speaker or on our panels. And uh, yeah, we hope to <coughs> inspire you and uh, boost you in your organizations and maybe you'll get new ways of thinking around talent. So what are you hoping to achieve, Niklas, for today? Well, um, a lot actually, <laughs> uh, but maybe I hope for more than we can live up to. But anyway, I think uh, a day like this uh, needs to address things that we need to understand together. So uh, since we know that AI is an a topic that uh, builds on collaboration really and uh, since we also know that our partners out there you uh, list talent attraction as number one and perhaps both number one and number two so this is really why we are having this talent day and we hope to bring you knowledge of course but we hope to understand the topic a bit more we hope to lift new questions and that's uh, really what i hope most for so could you say a, thing, a few things about the agenda and the yes, practicalities, Ivana? Of course, yes. So yeah, uh, hopefully last uh, Zoom online event and hopefully we can meet in, in real life soon. And uh, this event will be recorded. So if you uh, as a participant don't want to be on video uh, and, and don't want to be shared, so please keep your camera off. Um, we are in for a very exciting three hours 
<clears throat> and we have divided these three hours into three main blocks and topics. So we will start f with the first topic, uh, the competition for talent, where we have very two exciting keynote speakers and we have a panel discussion. In the second block, we'll talk about Sweden as a talent destination. There we also have very exciting keynote speakers and, and panel discussions. And then in the third one, we are going to talk about co-creating talent opportunities. We're going to tell you a little bit more what we do here in uh, Sweden, how you can engage as a partner and, and more to come. We have some exciting news to present in the last hour. We have very exciting news. So stay for that hour. News. Yes, and uh, Q&As, uh, please keep your question coming in the chat. Uh, because of the time, we may not maybe have time to uh, ask the questions right away to the keynote speakers, but we will we'll save them until the panel discussion, because that's perfect opportunity to, to get your question answered from more than just the keynote speakers. So we will collect all the questions and take them later in the panels. Yeah, I think that's uh, all for, for the practicalities. We would really like to receive a lot of questions. We would also like you to engage with each other in the chat. So please say hello, say, say where you are in Sweden or, or in the world. Where are you tuning in from? What are you hoping to achieve? Yeah, so Niklas, take us into the first topic. So let's uh, go then. Topic. Yes, right. let's go. So off we go. Well, then we go into the your first block. And uh, to say a few words about the block, this is uh, where we would like to understand the competition for, for talents. We know that, that within the, the AI uh, topic, within the area of AI, uh, there is a huge um, search for AI talents. And we know that this, is, this has come much further, far out in the world. We'll hopefully get examples of that. So during this first block, we try to understand what does this war for talent look like out there, uh, specifically when it comes to AI? So, uh, with that said... Yes, we would like to welcome our first keynote speaker, all the way from Canada. We are super excited to have her here. We have Anne Boilly, uh, that is the director of the AI ecosystem performance at the Forum AI. IA Quebec, you'll have to explain <laughs> that, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whose mission is to make AI a uh, lever for economic and social development in Quebec. She recently completed a PhD in political science, specializing in the ethics of AI for policymakers. And she will tell us about how you can boost your AI talent pipeline and everywhere that counts, and how Quebec is tackling the challenge. Please, Anne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, so I'll share my screen. Then I'll stop mine. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting us, the Forum IA Quebec, to uh, AI Sweden Talent Day. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Peter, for thinking and inviting us and also Nicholas and Ivana who are making this day possible. Um, I'm also very much looking forward to hear about um, the talent question in Sweden from the other uh, speakers and panelists uh, a little later. Um, so maybe I can start with uh, a very short introduction of the Forum IA Quebec. Um, you had mentioned, Ivana, our, our mission statement uh, to support the development of Quebec's uh, artificial intelligence ecosystem. Um, so today I'll be talking a bit more about Quebec than Canada as a whole, because our organization um, is for the province specifically. Um, but there are going to be a, a, few, a few pieces of data about Canada itself. Um, our goal is yes to use the to use AI to as an economic and social uh, lever for the for the economy of Quebec. Um, so it's a little similar in some way to uh, AI Sweden, although um, we're a much smaller organization. I think we're ten times smaller than you guys are. Um, we also have this uh, goal of encouraging businesses to adopt AI. Um, so, anyways, lots of common challenges, I think. Um, the issue of talent, more specifically, is a pressing one for all our ecosystems. 
uh, technical talent for AI is really scarce and all over the world we're all fighting for or trying to fight for the same talent. We're trying to attract the same people. So today I'd like to share um, a little bit of our strategy here in Quebec. So um, in this context of war for talent, um, so I'll start just with big trends globally, what's happening around the world, uh, and then I'll give you a bit of an idea of what the state of AI talent is right now in Quebec, and then share a little bit of our AI talent strategy to dive into future challenges um, towards the end. So we're all aware that the demand for AI uh, people is rising. In this graph, you can see from the OECD um, that the AI hiring has been increasing between 2017 and 2020 um, in a marked way. So if you're interested in locating Canada, it's the green line and the brown line is Sweden. Um, also, according to a 2021 analysis of national AI strategies by Brookings, um, we've seen during the pandemic a global increase of AI adoption in companies, which of course then requires more AI specialists. So with such a growing needs, there is an issue of not only looking for talent right now, but planning ahead. Um, because we need to think of the students that are in the STEM um, fields that are coming up the pipeline in order to provide for uh, our needs in, in AI in the coming years. So the, the Brookings study is informing us that talent supply in Quebec and Canada, as well as in Sweden, is okay right now, but only for now. In the graph that you see uh, on the screen, uh, you have this analysis of all the countries that have had published a, um, a national AI strategy. And um, there are two axes, so future prepared and present prepared. Um, and then you can see that Canada and Sweden are both on the same boat on the top left quarter, which means that we are present prepared for um, AI talent. We seem to have enough right now, although we could discuss that, but we're not um, future prepared. So if we look at the STEM students, uh, we don't have enough for the coming years. So um, that is something to keep in mind. Um, and also, if we want to look at who are the leaders and how they're doing um, and what we can learn from them, we can look at the top uh, right corner. So India, Germany, Singapore, and the UK. So keeping these global, very global trends in mind, um, let's take a closer look at Quebec. So um, last fall, we have asked uh, Tardis to include Quebec in its global AI index. So Sweden is also part of it, but Quebec is the first um, nation that's not a state that was included in the global AI index. So the results are not published on its website yet, but it's, it's coming up probably this month. Um, so the global AI index is um, actually benchmarks nations on their level of investment, innovation, and implementation of AI. And there are 62 countries that are on it. Um, Tortoise uses 143 indicators that are divided into seven pillars, the first one being talent. <coughs> Excuse me. So the results for Quebec came out in November and we were seventh uh, in the world, so top 10, um, which we were very happy about, of course. Um, but then when we looked at talent, so uh, the depth and the quality of the pool of everyday AI practitioners, um, we ranked 12. So we're not doing as well there. Uh, so there is obviously work to be done. Um, some of the challenges we observe in Quebec are probably similar abroad. Um, one thing is that local pipelines do not produce enough talent. If we look only in the city of Montreal, um, immigrants represent 28%, so more than a quarter of all professors, students, and administration people in a sample of the Montreal Research Centers. While this is very good news for us that we can have uh, so many workers from the outside, um, it does indicate that local pipelines are not sufficient. Um, a whole other side of the question of talent is diversity. So this is not um, the main focus of, of my presentation, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea. Um, there has been a study done in um, 
in Quebec on the works for the workforce, excuse me, in AI, data science and big data. And less than 20% of all employees in these fields are women. Um, if we look at uh, more global data on the right hand side in the graph, um, probably we can't read the, the name of the countries very well, but the green, um, the green line is the average um, cross country AI skills penetration by gender. And Canada's uh, lower than that average, so we're 15% um, percent, uh, less. So all our female workers are 15% less likely to report AI skills than the average female worker. Um, so that in and of itself is also something to keep in mind and probably something we could uh, discuss a little later. All right, so I wanted to point out maybe three um, main challenges that we have in Quebec that probably uh, we share around the globe. Uh, the first one being the most obvious one, uh, technical talent. So what we call the AI talent war uh, tells us that we do need workers with technical skills. Uh, this is actually when we, when we think of the global pool of AI talent that could be rising, one thing to keep in mind is that it will always be limited. So our needs could be infinite, but the, the workers themselves uh, or the resources are limited. So the real game is to develop our talent locally because we're all fighting for them internationally. Um, so that is worth for Quebec, it's worth for Sweden, but also all around the world. Um, and the challenge there is that training takes years. Um, the analysis of our talent pool by Twitter revealed that we were scoring very well on AI engineers on social media. So that means actually LinkedIn. Um, but our score was poor on data engineers on social media. So how is that interesting? Well, for us just to have this, um, these pieces of data from Turtus or other analysis can tell us where we need to focus our efforts, um, where we're strong and then where we need to work a little harder. The second challenge that we identify in Quebec is not only the workers or the talent that produces AI, but also the talent that will be using AI solutions in the future. So non-AI professions are impacted by AI, we know that. Um, if we only take the legal sector, if we just wanna take this very concrete example, um, lawyers and legal workers are gonna need to learn how AI works at least minimally in order to, to work assisted by these AI solutions. We cannot arrive at uh, situations where, um, as we know, the algorithm could have produced a result that we cannot explain, just as we see on, this, um, on the picture on the screen. Um, also, there are new jobs that are appearing because of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, new skills are becoming more and more important. Um, there was uh, a friend of mine who's an elementary school teacher who told me that they were told that the kids they're teaching right now, they'll have jobs that we don't even know of. Like we don't even, these jobs don't even exist right now. So to keep in mind that everything is changing very fast and uh, users need to be equipped. Uh, we need to focus on talents there as well in order uh, for us to exploit the full potential of AI for our ecosystems. Um, in uh, Quebec City, in the Université Laval, we have the International Observatory of Societal Impacts of AI and the Digital Technology, short uh, is obvia, and uh, they have produced a review of skills that uh, the skill needs that are arising from the development and implementation of AI. And one thing that they note is uh, that we'll need more AI knowledge and AI skills in AI using industries. So all across the board, all industrial sectors are starting and we hope they keep doing it fast to uh, implement AI in, their, in the supply chain and uh, the, um, the way they produce the services, but um, we'll need them to understand how AI works. And most especially, we'll need managers, leaders, to understand the full potential of AI. So this last point, point um, leads us to the third uh, Quebec challenge, which is talent in managers. So managers are at the core of work reorganization, 
as well as the development of new business models and strategies. We know that the full, uh, the full business the, will develop according to the rhythm of its managers. So it is crucial that managers understand what can be done with technology. And in order to do so, they require training as well. So we could call that upskilling, but because they're already um, working, but this is gonna be very much necessary. <clears throat> uh, the American economist, Eric Brynjolfsson from the Stanford Institute of Human-Centered AI, uh, has done an analysis of the adoption of electricity in factories um, in relation to managers and their vision for technology. And he noticed that the full potential of electricity on productivity was only noticed when new managers who were aware of the potential of technology came um, into those factories. And it took 30 years in, or in order to harness the full potential of that new technology. So, that's something to keep in mind for AI, which is even more pervasive than, than electricity and uh, holds probably more potential as well. So uh, interesting piece of information um, that is crucial when we think of talent. Another one is what is the structure of our economy? What do our businesses look like? And we know that in Canada and in Quebec, our economic structure uh, rests most uh, predominantly on SMEs, and those are run by a small number of people. Um, an analysis by Delorier and, um, and uh, his partners revealed that SMEs that are led by university graduates are more likely to adopt advanced technology, and uh, they have a greater propensity to innovate and export, and also to um, acquire intellectual property. So it can go up to 87% that SMEs led by a university graduate would be more likely to have adopted advanced technology in the past three years. So when they did their analysis was between 2018 and 2021. As suggested by um, in the Essential AI Handbook for Leaders, and I thank Ivana for the, the, the reference here. Um, and I quote, at the end of the day, it is not technology that creates success, it is people. It is leaders that take the right decisions based on the most accurate data, insights, and their ability to work with the best people. It is the ones who do this faster than the competition that will succeed. So now if we look into the our Quebec AI strategy, I'd like to first present what we've done so far and in our ecosystem and then what we're planning uh, to do based on all these uh, observations. So actions taken so far, um, we know that AI and data science skills are indispensable when thinking of the talent shortage, which we have seen is more likely to keep growing in the coming years. So as far back as 2018, we've been uh, thinking about these questions in our national AI strategy. Um, and in this uh, strategy, the cluster committee had made six recommendations. Uh, one of them, the first one being the ability to attract researchers, ensure the influx, uh, and we're talking here, quality and quantity of local and foreign students and graduate programs. Also understand what are the needs of our stakeholders, what are their opportunities in the, in the digital sciences. This has to be done also with a teaching institution. So to make sure that their offer is adapted to the needs of the industrial sectors, um, what, they, what they provide as training, and also to promote mathematical literacy, democratization of science uh, as young as elementary school, and also one thing that we are doing here at the forum, and I'll be talking a, a little bit about it uh, later, to facilitate the access to all these resources into one common um, source of information, which is um, what we call la vitrine de l'IA in French, um, so our showcase of AI. Another thing that has been done um, and that started being effective last year is a new uh, permanent immigration pilot program for workers in AI, IT, and visual effects sectors. 
So this will be in effect for five years, so until January 2026. And concretely with this program, uh, the Quebec province can select uh, 550 people per year with their family members, and uh, 275 of them would be Quebec graduates and temporary workers in the AI sector. Um, in Quebec, and we could talk about immigration um, a little later, but it is a shared jurisdiction with the federal government. So Quebec would get to pick or to choose um, the, the newcomers, but this uh, is done in partnership with the federal government, so with the Canadian government. Other things that have been done, um, the Information and Communication Technology Sector Workforce Committee, which is called Technocompetence, has produced a workforce profile on AI, data science, and big data in 2021. What you see on the screen is uh, an example of a series of job profiles in those fields that they have produced. So this is all in French. I'm sorry, we didn't have an, uh, at least according to my knowledge, we didn't have an English version of that. But what you see in these job profiles is, well, the job title, obviously, but also the other designations uh, for this job, its tasks, uh, the evolution of job offers, uh, pool estimation, key skills and qualities, percentage of job offers, salaries. So basically everything you'd want to know about this particular job uh, will be listed on there. So an analysis such as this helps us see where the needs are, what the needs are, and um, they have uh, let us know that in the Quebec ecosystem we need more data engineers, data translators, maintenance managers for AI solutions, and also um, specialists in human-machine interaction. Um, other things that have been done lately in the Quebec uh, AI ecosystem is a um, pilot study on salaries in the AI sector by a firm called uh, Normandin Baudry. And we'd like in, in the future to extend that study to a larger N. Why is that important? It's because um, the main data we were using on salaries beforehand were for North America. So that includes the whole of Canada, um, other ecosystems such as Ontario, and also the United States. Um, it does not help us to specifically pinpoint what the challenges are for Quebec to know if we're competitive in our salaries offer. And that's important for us to know, as also we have the particularity of being a French speaking province. So that could be when attracting talent, an extra challenge for people coming. Um, although the new pilots, uh, pilot program in immigration did not have specific uh, um, language requirement apart from uh, committing to learning French eventually. So you could uh, either be a Francophone or you could commit to learning French eventually and, and work and come here and work already. Um, so we need to know about salaries um, in order to know how we're doing there. Um, we also have another actor in our ecosystem, the PIA, which uh, is the Montreal's Higher Education Cluster in AI. And they have been created to make sure that in the region of Montreal, colleges and universities offer an AI training responds or is aligned with the needs of the industrial sector. So it got, gathers close to 20 uh, universities and colleges. And they have published at the end of last year an inventory of training components in AI in order to know really what's, what do we have uh, to offer that goes a bit further than only the websites of the, of the teaching institutions. And um, what are the emerging projects? What are the, the teaching barriers in AI? So this also is very helpful for our showcase of, um, of AI um, because this virtual hub that we're, we are building um, at, the, um, at the Forum IA Quebec um, will help us list all the players, all the services and the data of the Quebec ecosystem. And this is an effort of centralizing all the resources in the end and be a source of answers for all those who look for answers um, for on the AI ecosystem so that you be talent yourself or recruiting talent 
uh, you'd be an academic, you're in the business sector, no matter where you are, everything will be centralized there. So this is supposed to be unveiled in March of this year. And another study has been uh, done, it's not yet published, but will soon be completed by Cyrano, which is a center for research and organization analysis. And they have led a comparative analysis of AI ecosystems with the aim of identifying in, uh, innovative uh, practices and training and knowledge transfer. Uh, so that's helpful because they have been able to look around the globe for uh, best practices in AI uh, training, also around Canada, and make a few propositions as to how we could improve our strategy. Um, I see on my screen a little like blue window. Okay, here it should. I hope you guys weren't seeing that the whole time. All right. So what are action points for the future um, in Quebec? And um, this is also going to help well, the whole of Canada in the end. Um, well, we have launched a talent collaborative project um, in the past few months, and we have directions for the future. They still need development. Those are um, still being discussed, but just to share a little bit what we have in mind. Um, our priority projects would be to consult our ecosystem to know um, what were the effects of the special pilot program in immigration. So is it well known? Is it well understood? Um, do actors uh, use it actually? What needs to be improved? So one year later, that could be um, something to be done. Um, then we'd like to create a talent section in our AI showcase, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this could help the companies locate and understand information, um, including about government programs that they need to train or recruit talent. Projects we'd like to support, well, I mentioned it, a more comprehensive study of salaries. We'd also like to, in the long term, so that won't be done in the, in the next year per se, but we'd like to support the creation of AI training for managers. So one thing we had in mind is maybe in all MBA programs in Quebec, we could include a component of AI training. That way, uh, future leaders would be equipped with at least basic knowledge and understanding of AI. And also survey our ecosystem to see what is the AI training that business, businesses and employees use for upskilling? Um, how, how, is, how are these training components uh, perceived? Are they used through traditional ch uh, channels or non-traditional channels? And then this could help us also win an inventory effort. So I'd like to end with um, a few future challenges. Um, so as mentioned, and I think this is the ongoing battle is for technical skills. Um, getting to know our own ecosystem will help us see where to invest how to improve and how to strategize, because then we'll have an idea on how we're faring uh, on, on, this, on this field. And probably we do have a lot of common points, but we also have probably um, very um, particularities that are specific to us. Also, soft skills, we shouldn't forget about them because they are very important just right now, AI professionals, um, are required more and more to develop um, more soft skills. Um, so cooperation, leadership, teamwork, communication, those are all needed right now. But also as we move from a weaker to a stronger AI, the AI talent demand will change and not only soft skills will be required, but also a rising need of talent that understands the human brain and the human person um, in order for us to be able to, to work towards that a stronger AI. So neuroscientists, philosophers, linguists, ethicists, and sociologists, we also need, when we think of the long-term, to, uh, to keep them in, in, our, in our vision. So different talents will be required for a different AI. And I think in AI Sweden and the Forumia Quebec, it's our role to, to keep an eye on that. So thank you for your attention. I very much look forward to, to exchange and, 
and answer questions. Thank you, Anne. Uh, fantastic. You uh, have a lot of mind-blowing perspectives here, and I'm sure we'll come back to them. Uh, we are uh, glad that you will stay along and you will take part, part of the uh, panel discussions soon. But uh, before we go into panel discussions, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Sofia Hedin, uh, coming from uh, IT Högskolan in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. So uh, Sofia, you have been working uh, developing IT and uh, user uh, uh, experience, user interface training courses, for example, web programming courses and so on. So you have a, a lot of experience working with uh, AI related developments, uh, education and, and uh, working with partners because you are part of something called vocational schools um, yes. and maybe you, you will elaborate a bit on that. So please, I Sophia, will. very welcome to bring the Swedish perspective. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, Ivana, and thank you, Anne, for an interesting presentation. And as Nicholas said, I will give you the Swedish perspective on how the pool of AI talents can be increased through vocational colleges. So my name is Sofia Hedien, and I work as a program manager at IT Högskolan in Gothenburg. So I have the overall responsibility for some of our programs. IT Högskolan is a vocational college and Yrkes Högskola that exists in Stockholm since 2018 and in Gothenburg since 2012. And we focus on and only offer IT focused educations and have programs with several different programming languages, designers, testers, IT program managers. And since last year, we also have the program AI and machine learning developer. So I will tell you about how vocational colleges apply for and are granted educations, who our applicants and students are where they might end up after their studies with us and the industry's potential to impact the content and the results of our educations. So vocational college is post-secondary education and the most common form are one to two year long programs. They are commonly more practical than university studies as at least 25% of the studies are. Nya, this stands for learning in a workplace environment or simply internship. Vocational colleges are controlled by the authorities of vocational colleges, meaning they get them for yrkes and skolan, who provide funds for us to operate education. And the authorities approve or decline applications by schools regarding what programs they want to start. And they also control us to make sure that we follow all the rules and that we offer high quality education. And shortly, our main purpose is to offer education that will lead to employment upon graduation. And every fall, it's a school line as well as all the other vocational colleges apply for new programs to start in the upcoming year. And the authorities approve a certain number of starts, commonly two or three. So we also have to reapply for programs that we've already had. And in these applications, the authorities look at several different factors, mainly our marketing research, what companies we have behind us or backing the program, and most importantly, the future employment market. They also look at how many programs on the similar subject already exist in the area. And if we reapply for programs that we've already had, they look at number of students, number of students who have graduated, and the number of students who are in a relevant position six months after graduating. And when we start a new application process before deciding what programs to apply for, we make an extensive market analysis and research. We try to figure out what is new within IT, what is going to be the big next thing, where can we find a hole in the employment market or a lack of or a shortage of competence? And as we are an IT university, we have an extensive network with insights that help us in this process. And when we start processing the applications, we always 
test them towards the industry to see what the response is and to see if there is a clear need. And in January, the authorities publish what programs are granted. Then we have to finalize the course content. We have to set the order in which the courses will be, employ teachers or consultants, and we start marketing the program towards applicants and towards possible future students. We also put together a program board with representatives from the industry, which I will tell you more about later. There are some other forms of education that also go under vocational college. The authorities handle and approve short programs, they usually span over less than a semester and are taught part-time. And these programs are commonly promoted towards people who are already in the industry and who want to gain some extra competence. Another possibility is commission training or education. This is an opportunity for employers to purchase specific courses or an entire training to increase the competence of their existing staff. So companies can contact a school and ask them to put together a course that fits their exact needs. And as I mentioned before, we started the AI and machine learning developer program last year at the school in Gothenburg. We had over 200 applicants and 27 students that started in August. The program is two years long with eight weeks of internship during the third semester and 14 weeks of internship during the fourth and last semester. And the students in this program, as well as in all of our programs, have very varied backgrounds. They are either studying for the first time after high school, or they want to change their already existing careers. Something that they all have in common is that they're very interested, interested in the field of AI and want to get better understanding of the field, as well as they want to graduate with good possibilities to find a job. And one of our students has a master's in behavioral science and psychology, and she wants to combine this with her new AI knowledge to work in medtech. And another person has a PhD in finance and want to take a step into fintech. And I think that this is really a big advantage for vocational colleges that many of our students have backgrounds from other studies or from work, and they come to us to get the practical knowledge and to get a job. The program has a very high pace and I'm so impressed by the students. They are so engaged and committed and super ambitious. Some courses that they study are Python, data processing, algebra, statistics, and several different machine learning courses. And throughout the whole program, they learn how to present and visualize data. And as we don't have any graduates from this program yet, we don't know exactly what positions they will end up in. And the class that started last year will have their first internship after the summer. We think that they will work as AI or machine learning developers, Python developers, or data scientists. One student has already had meetings about the internship in the fall, and they have discussed focusing on statistic modeling and machine learning methods for risk prediction. And I really want to emphasize the impact that the industry can have on all of our programs, well, on all programs that are a part of vocational college, really. You can contribute and you can benefit. Companies have a huge role in the applications, claiming their future need of competence. And this is really a crucial factor for schools to get their programs granted. As I briefly mentioned before, each program has a program, program board that consists of the program manager, in this case, me, uh, student representatives from the classes, someone from the educational system, and the majority of the members are from the industry. And this group has a lot of power to make changes and to form the programs after their company's needs, after the industry's needs. And for me, who don't have the extensive technical knowledge in the field, I really rely on this group to be the experts of the industry 
and to have knowledge about what will be attractive on the market. Other ways to impact are through teaching guest lectures or full courses. And this is a great opportunity to market your company to potential future employees. And last but not least, I think that more companies have to see the benefits of taking in interns. And when talking about finding IT or specifically AI competence, it's evident that students that perform well at their LEA placement often get an employment there before graduating. And some of our students are even higher during their first internship period when they have a whole year left to study. Uh, so if you wanna hire qualified future graduates, they should be taken in as interns. They are very much able to contribute and it's also a form of probationary employment while the company has to offer supervision during this time. And a few weeks ago, we started this year's application process and we are ready to educate the next class of future AI competence. And if there's something that I want you to bring with you for my presentation, it is that the industries and the company's roles in creating this competence should not be underestimated. They have a huge part in forming the future competence in the field of AI and in enabling vocational colleges to do so. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sophia. Very good presentation. And I really believe that vocational colleges have a really important uh, play, part to play here. And, and uh, I totally agree what you said as well, that uh, internships are key so that the students get to uh, practice what they learn. Thank you. And Sophia will stay with us in the panel. So we are going to welcome two more panelists because now we're switching over to the panel discussions. We have Sophia Lindman joining, Future of Work, uh, Marketing Manager at Jobelon. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you so much. And we have uh, the CEO and, and uh, co-founder of Exparang, Carl Schander. Very welcome, Carl, to the panel. Thank you very much. Yes. Welcome, and I would like to start uh, with a question to Sophia. Uh, you are calling yourself a digital nomad. Can you explain to us what that is and why you choose to become one? Yes, um, I'm going to try not to get too philosophical and deep, <laughs> but um, it was uh, essentially a decision I made because <clears throat> I wanted to create a life for myself that felt more authentic. And um, I didn't want to adjust like my entire reality to fit a job because sometimes when we you know apply for a job, uh, we might perhaps have to move to a city where the headquarter is because that's where the office is. And that means that you're not only signing up for a job, like you're signing up for an entire entire new reality. Uh, so the job itself might feel great, but the location might not always feel like a great fit. And that was the case for me. So the question I had to myself was like, can I still live in a location or even multiple locations that makes me feel happy and alive and productive and still do a great job, even if I'm not at the physical office? And it turned out that it was very possible. Um, so that's how it kind of started. I'm curious, Sophia, where are you right now? I'm actually in Mexico right now. I've been here for almost six months. Uh, that's why I have a fan here <laughs> in, in the background. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, to continue, one more question, Sophia. We are, have been listening to uh, uh, keynotes that talks obviously of great changes to the society and you represent that change yourself but you're also part of a company working to try to adapt to these changes so how would you say uh, Sophia that companies uh, of the future could uh, help in this sense of attracting uh, talents like yourself how would they need to uh, adopt how would they need to work a uh, really good question um, I mean, these past two years, people had a lot of time to, you know, evaluate the path they're on and reimagine the life state they want to live. 
And we can see in statistics today that these you know, realizations that people had in these past two years had led, led to actual lifestyle changes. So we can see in a report released by the remote lab that people have more people have moved out of the city than into the city for the first time in a really long time. Uh, and um, countries are making it easier to live and work at locations long term by announcing remote work visas or digital nomad visas. So things are really changing. Uh, and we can see that in terms of like relocation patterns. And I believe that we need to look at, we need, I, I usually call it like an identity crisis because it's not like companies are so sure about who they are. And when we're going through a paradigm shift and like an incredible change, um, I think it's important to ask yourself like the values that we stand for back in the day, are they relevant in this new world of the, the, the new way of work, oh, sorry, in <laughs> the new way of working. And because uh, I can imagine that a lot of companies also, especially when the pandemic hit, uh, realized that the old way of leading, for example, didn't really work. Like you can't use control in order to lead when you're not physically in the same space. So we need new type of skills in terms of how to lead. Um, so yeah, I believe that we have to adapt to the digital world that we live in. And, but that's not an easy change. I mean, we have to change the entire infrastructure. Uh, so it's a big question, but I do believe that we need to look at what I said from the beginning, the patterns, what people want, how people want to work uh, and start like that. I think that's a good starting point. I'm sorry, that, I hope that wasn't that too of a messy answer. No, 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 that was perfect. Uh, that was excellent. Yeah, um, really good. Thank you. And, and interesting point of view. And I think a lot of people can relate to, to what you're saying, that they feel that their life work balance is more important than just the job. So, yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl, I would like to uh, ask you a question. Uh, Sophia mentioned here that companies are doing what they can to attract the talent, but there is still a, a perception that it's hard to attract AI talents. What is your uh, point of view on that since you work with recruitment? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, we've heard from so Anne and, and Sophia and everybody else here so far that um, the market is, is boiling. It's, um, it's an extremely difficult market for, for talent in general. Uh, but then if we look at AI talent in particular, it's, um, um, it's even more difficult and challenging, of course. Um, um, I think uh, just to pick up on, on what Sophia uh, Lindman, what you, you're, the way you're pursuing your career in life, I think that's very inspiring. And I think that is, uh, we'll see a lot more of that in the future, people who will um, uh, both choose to and be able to, um, to pursue their careers in, in, in that way. And I also like the fact that you, uh, you emphasize the, um, uh, the individual's perspective in, in the, um, in the market and that um, the balance of power has, as we all know, shifted into talents, to the talent's favor. Um, and, and therefore um, there will be um, a lot more of mutual matching in, in, in the future in, the, in this market. Um, the, the way I see the market, it, it's, it's really, um, if you will, you can liken it to the world's biggest puzzle, the, the global job market. And, um, uh, it, it's not a thousand pieces, it's, it's billions of pieces that, that need to fit with the right opportunities. And uh, most of this puzzle is still in the box. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we're just scratching the surface in terms of the potential of getting more pieces to fit together. And um, that's where I think uh, if we see the, uh, take a positive stance on 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 uh, what AI can do for us, uh, then then that is very much it to really uh, make sure that we um, uncover those matches that are in the market today, but that are blocked or uh, by by human behavior or by us not being able to to actually uh, see uh, matches that are out there. Um, so. 
why it's so hard. It's, it's, it's a question a question of supply and demand, basically. I think Anne, you you did a fantastic job uh, uh, presenting the challenges. There's not enough supply. It will take time to 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 grow supply, and the demand uh, for the foreseeable future is is just growing. Thank you, Carl. Now I'd like to turn to Anne here, and you were talking about uh, different kinds of skills that you look will be needed in the future. And leadership is coming up, and we also see questions in our Q and A here. How important is really this that the that managers? Uh, uh, what, what's the role of ma the managers here in this transformation, and how important is the management skills within AI? Yeah. Um, well, that's that's a a good question. Managers are important when you think of, of the business itself and the growth of the business and what I was trying to, to show the, the importance that managers understand the potential of AI, but managers are also important for the well-being of AI workers and they have to, to know that their manager understands at least um, the basics of what he's asking them to do or he or she is asking them to do um, and the manager will also set the tone of of the whole business of the the work conditions and talent being scarce and businesses fighting to get the same talent i think leaders will make the world of a difference between organizations um, and make some of them more attractive by work conditions uh, understanding of what the of what the skills of the workers are one thing to keep in mind um, is that sometimes you have extraordinarily qualified AI workers that are employed only to clean databases. And that's, that's a problem because it means there's a lack of understanding between what they can do and what they're being asked to do. Um, so I think leaders, even if they're not the ones doing the practical work, they they definitely are going to set the tone, technically speaking, but also humanly speaking. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anne. And we have received a question from, from the audience and in our chats. Is there a common definition of what constitutes, a, constitutes AI skills? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> And you, you um, define it as three parts, right? I mean, it's, it's a technical part to it, and uh, or category, if you will, and then the the user category and the leadership category. Um, there are, of course, subcategories, uh, infinite subcategories within those three larger categories. Um, it's a difficult one to answer, but. I think you should keep a very broad mind when you talk about AI talent, because it's not only the, the engineering part, it's, it's of course, uh, everything related to it. And, and, and especially we should not forget the AI ethics part and, and the, the, the ability to understand what it really is about and the effects of AI uh, in practice and so forth, the risks. Now, we also have a question uh, from the chat around school and uh, so directed to Anne, uh, how are you working with uh, in Quebec with the developing the school systems when it comes to like basic schools or or high school level schools are you working there as well yes there are many initiatives ongoing um, one of them it's interesting because they're really aiming the government and other actors in the ecosystem are working with collaborating and like allying forces. So we have uh, technological transfer centers that work with high schools, for example, in, in AI programs in, in order to, to select a few students and they have to apply. And then um, they have a, a special training, AI training program. Uh, there are also, and Carl was, was mentioning it, and I think it's incredibly important. There is more and more, um, uh, campaigns uh, to make people more sensitive to AI, responsible AI, which um, is, is central when we think of developing the technology. Um, so making the students, like young students, reflect upon what are the implications of their use of AI, uh, regardless if they develop it or if they only they, they use it. 
And I was uh, also reading an article not so long ago about how libraries in elementary school are completely changing. Now, uh, the students are, are they, they enter a new digital world um, in, in those libraries. So, um, and then we have this uh, very big actor in, in Canada, Scale AI a Cluster, the, the big AI cluster who um, offers training in businesses, but also um, uh, student training. So there are many ongoing initiatives, um, I'm sure in Sweden as well, but that's a little bit what's happening. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Uh, and um, on the topic of schools and education, I would like to invite Sofia uh, into the discussion. Um, do you think that the academic training of AI skills um, is, uh, adapt uh, is enough? Um, from if we look at the um, demands from the industry? Uh, good question. I think that <clears throat> vocational colleges are doing what they can. They're applying to start programs. We just have to make sure that the authorities see that there is a need and that our applications are good um, so that we can start the programs. And it will be really interesting to see when this first class comes out and we'll start to search for jobs and see if they will be taken right away or if they have to put in a lot of effort to, to find their first job. And I think that is really when, when we can see from our perspective if, if it's enough or if there should be more programs started. Hmm. And from the university side, I can't really, uh, I don't know how that looks really. No, but that's okay from your perspective. And yeah, uh, yeah it, it's going to be super interesting to follow your cohort and see see how it's perceived from the industry. I, I think time-wise, we right. are wrapping up. Yes, so we, we thank you all contributing both from the panel and our keynotes, especially, of course, Anne and Sophia. So thank you a lot. We are a bit now behind schedule. You're please welcome to stay, of course, and uh, putting questions in the Q&A. Uh, now we are a bit behind uh, schedule, so uh, I'd say uh, yes. we go on. Yes. And we Great. then uh, would, in I would like you to introduce the second block yes, here, Ivana. Yes, exactly. So now we'll slide into the second block. And the topic for this block is Sweden as a talent destination. So we are going to come back to Sweden, the Swedish ecosystem, look at the talents here, see uh, Sweden as a destination, how can we market Sweden as a destination of AI talents? What do the talents want when they are looking for new opportunities? And here we have very exciting keynote speakers. Right. Yes. So uh, opening up your camera here is uh, Patrick Walsh. And Patrick, you're an award-winning author. I know you're on to a new book. And you are also an immigrant to Sweden who have been working, uh, managing uh, at talent attraction questions from uh, Stockholm, I think. So please, Patrick, very welcome to this event. Thank you so much for, for giving me this opportunity. I'm just going to quickly share my screen, if, if you can see that there. Um, let, me just, Not yet. let me just do desktop one. Hopefully this works. And I'll play from the top. You can see that okay? There you go. Thanks. There we go. I'll just make this a little bit smaller. So thank you so much for having me. Um, of course, we are the, the Sweden Talent Foundation, which is a, a not-for-profit organization. And we, we truly have a passion for talent. And our goal with this foundation is to uh, make Sweden a global talent hub. As as you've just said there, I, I also am the author of the, the, the forthcoming book called Talent Cities. And along with Norris, uh, Boris Nordenstrom and Lars Henrik Fries Moline, I am the co-founder of, of this great organization that we're trying to build. What, what we do have is that I have been living and working in this great city for the last seven years. And the thing that really stands out to me most about this place is the amount of innovation that has come out of here and the, looking at it from an external perspective, Sweden has been able to achieve things which small nations like Ireland and, and others could never even dream of. And whenever I, I stand back and look at it, I believe that 
Sweden's all town success comes down to one thing. And that's the great people that, that make up this nation and the heights that they're able to climb to. Because no matter if you're born here or if, like myself, you're an immigrant who has been welcomed into the society, it's actually mind blowing that, that this place has been able to achieve the things they have and, and make the impact it has on the global stage. And that is really good from a talent attraction perspective. And that's what we're starting to realize more and more because it's talent and not capital, which is the key factor, which is going to be linking innovation, competitiveness and growth as we move forward in, in the coming years. And, and that's already becoming more and more relevant as, as we go. So the question is, do we have a problem? Like, does Sweden even need to talk about, you know, talent attraction and, and, and those kinds of things? Well, we, we sort of do, because whenever I was leaving university, I, I grew up in Northern Ireland and I was offered a job in Dublin. So I, I happily moved to that city to take on the job as, a, as an accountant and eventually a tax lawyer. But today, the talent have got so many options that two thirds of them are actually choosing the city which aligns with their values and, and, and likes before they choose the job or the company. And that's because if you're a talented person in this world, you have got so many options every single day coming in of people trying to headhunt you and bring you in and, and get you onto their projects. Then now choose where they want to go, where they want to live. And we've already seen a great example of that with, with Sophie in Mexico. So sometimes you have to stop and ask, what is talent? Why are we even spending this afternoon to come in and discuss this issue around talent and the importance of bringing it into society? Well, the reason why is because Talent is now the new currency of economic development. And to give you one statistic, there, I have a lot more, but this one sort of gives it to us at the most basic level. Whenever students graduate from university, that's them at, at their most basic level. So for every 25 international students that we can retain within our city for just one year after graduation, they are worth 2.6 million euros to us. But we, we know that this is not accurate at all because within the cities, you know, in Europe, we don't have 25 international students. What we have is closer to 25,000 international students. And that brings us up to 22.6 billion euros. And don't forget, this is this talent just at the start of their career. So if they're worth 2.6 billion as a collective, just in the first year, what, what are they going to be worth in 10 years time on their executive levels and, and really making such an impact within their teams? And this is something that I really want to push forward when it comes to talent, because these people are valuable. And if I'm to strip it right back, look at the definition of talent as per the Oxford English Dictionary. Everyone thinks about talent as being the first one, you know, the skill that they bring to the table. However, it's becoming more and more relevant that the second one is, is actually what we're, we're fighting over here because talent are so valuable that they are a unit of currency as they were back in biblical days. And it's not just the impact they bring themselves, it's the impact they bring to the wider society because for every high-tech job that we can create within our society, five additional jobs are created around it, both in skilled and unskilled occupations. And this is why everyone wants to get their hands on those talents. That guy in the middle with a big smile is in such demand because of his, what he brings to the market, to his teams and to the, the creator society around him is so valuable and people are willing to pay to have it. So if we are not talking about talent in, in this regard, or at least thinking about them and, and how valuable they are, then we really need to take our head out of the sand and give ourselves a good shake because otherwise we're going to lose what, what has been sort of coined as the war for talent. And there's, there's three sides to this coin. This is the side that we need to sort of focus on mostly from a Swedish perspective, because I'm talking as an immigrant who's come to the society, who loves the society and all that it brings to the table. And attraction is not, a, is not the biggest issue when it, when it comes to Sweden, because Sweden is an amazing society. It, it really has put its a head above the parapet and, and made an impact for itself around the world when it comes to awareness and people knowing that it exists. And that goes right down to many of the organizations such as Spotify and Volvo and the others. 
the big problem we have in this society is in retention. We are not keeping talent long enough. People are coming to Sweden, but they're just not sticking around. The average path through um, Stockholm in 2020, when I did the report for the city of Stockholm, was that on average, a talent will come from India. On average, they will stay for 22 months. And on average, they will leave and go to Amsterdam. So talent are sticking around in Europe, but they're only staying here for 22 months. The reason why, there's a few reasons why that's a big issue. Number one is that if they stuck around for 22 months, they probably decided to leave after a year. So we haven't really got much out of them for the last two months or the last 10 months. And they've just sort of been filling in their CV. Um, the other thing is that it's a negative return on investment for our, for our companies and for our society in general. And I would like to see us aiming for a, a, a target of 36 months to, to 60 months from three to five years to get talent to stay so that it can really benefit from them. And within the Sweden Talent Foundation, this is one of the things we're, we're sort of looking at for, for the society. The Stockholm Academic Forum said that four out of five talents in Stockholm are considering leaving the city because their spouse has, did not get a job or has not settled in the city. And it's something we need to look at because if we're going to attract these talent and bring them in, it's we must try our best to hold them and, and make sure that they really develop within the society when they are here. And this is core for me because what we really want to do is we want to get these bright people to truly connect into the structure, the, the systems and structures and organizations of, of what's, what Sweden is and what it stands for. Because from an AI perspective, we need the brightest people in the world working on the big problems in the world. So that's, that's what we have done. We have went out and we have talked to all the, the, the great and the good across the triple helix of um, business, academia, and government to find out where are the pain points? What are we looking at? Where are our big issues? And we all got them to put their hands in and show us, you know, from, a, from if we were to draft up a manifesto, what should be in it? And we, we, we got 33 fantastic issues that we had to deal with, and we actually broke it down into um, nine. At the very core, we think that we should be aiming to make Sweden a global talent hub. We should be attracting talent that comes here and stays and, and develops their career here within our society and the great projects that we're building across AI and others. And within this, we have broken it down into three strong pillars. The first one is obviously attraction. Second one is to deal with uh, you know, showing, showing up. And the third one is lobbying. And I'm going to just touch on them quickly. For, for what they are. Obviously, the first one, talent attraction structures. What do we need to have in place? Top of the, top of the pile, for us to, to truly understand what's missing, we need to, we need to have accurate data-driven tools that'll show us what's within, this, what's within the pool. What do we have? What will we need tomorrow? What do we need today? And what are we currently missing today? Because with true data-driven insights into what we have within our talent pool, that gives us um, the opportunity to then to fix it and prepare better for tomorrow. In addition to that, the thing that we're building is we have got really great feedback of something that has worked across all our European cities, which is a talent toolbox, where uh, across, across the city, there's a single branding, there's a single um, logos and videos and, and things that small medium-sized organizations can use to attract talent in and it's in a, it has an umbrella which actually has a red thread that runs through the city the third one is one that's that breaks my heart as an immigrant because i live here in a beautiful uh, city in a great country and i i see headlines such as um just at the start of december the germans and the, their largest newspaper had a headline that said sweden is the most dangerous country in europe and from a talent attraction retention perspective, that's a nightmare for us because it scares off so many people because people are thinking, what the hell is going on up there? And it's not, it's not true. And it, and it annoys me as an immigrant coming here because I can't talk highly enough about the society that we're in and the safety levels and things like that. But the issue is here, there is enough negative stories going out into the international press around how bad Sweden is. And what I would like us to do is actually tell the other side of the story, because the stories that are going out, some of them are true, 
However, we can also tell the, the other side of the story, which is also true, which is the million other stories, which where Sweden is contributing to the world with AI, with kindness, with peace, with seat belts. You know, there's so many great things and we can share that story as well. And we must share it because the negative stuff is going on quite deeply. Representation matters and heroes matter. And for us to attract and, and, and retain these people, we must sometimes go fishing. And one of the best ways to go fishing is to highlight the people who have done it well. One of the great people involved in our project is a fantastic gentleman called Lars Henry Fries Moline. And he has been moving the Future Talent Summit around the world over the past few years. And two, the last year they had it, obviously, it was 2019, where they had held it in London and they had Tony Blair as the keynote. We're supposed to hold it in 2020 in Dav in uh, in Qatar and have Angela Merkel as keynote. And whenever we got whenever me myself and Boris got talking to him, we decided that why should we be moving this around? You're a Swedish guy. Um, we have one of the best organizations that we have moved around the world. We have all the universities connected to it already, all the thought leaders around talent. So why do we not just stick it in Stockholm every summer during midsummers? and have the world's best people to come to this city where we have a great event in the Nobel Prize room in the Blue Room at the Stadshuset. And it's a Davos for talent. And we run it out of Stockholm every single year. So that's one of the things we're going to do. So the people automatically associate Stockholm as being um, not just the city of Nobel, but also the city of talent. And that's, that's a work that's already working. The second thing we must do is we've been talking about putting up 5 million kroners to five different teams with a, a Stockholm AI challenge. And of course, it'll be great to sort of dial into some of the great minds around AI on this call in that regard and sort of thrash that out. The third thing is a future talent awards and particularly showcasing global female founders and entrepreneurs, not just from across Stockholm, but from across Europe. And it's these people will be chosen as a, by a panel of their peers from across Europe. And the reason why we have to do this is that representation does matter. We must bring young women from around the world in on this, and they must see that Stockholm is a woman's place and it's a place where they can actually have their voice heard and where they can actually create great careers and make a global difference to, to global megatrends. And, and lastly, the third pillar that we have is actually talking about talent policy projects. And, and this is basically lobbying. We are, are sort of falling behind in a way where it comes to the fast track onboarding of talent. Some people are taking up to four years from, from the interviews that I have given myself. They're taking up to four years just to get a personal number. And, and this is in a society where without a personal number, you can't even join the gym. You basically don't exist. So we can do more around that. And particularly when it comes to some of the best talent in the world, some of these AI-minded people who can solve, help us solve global megatrends, I would like us to have a global impact visa. Uh, in addition to that, I've shown you the statistics around the value of talent, or sorry, the value of talent students when it comes to, and whenever I was in the city of Stockholm, we could only keep talent for six months after graduation. That has now been increased to 12 months. For me, it's still not enough. And I'll tell you why, because the graduate in May, everyone goes off on holidays until September. Now they've got seven or eight months left on their visa and employers just don't want to take a chance of going through everything with them. So they just don't get hired anyway. My belief is this needs to be increased two, three years. And in addition, it should be opened up to the top 150 universities worldwide with talents who have got a skill set that we require within our society. And again, this is a core part of it. We must show talent that we are open to, to working with them. And this is a society where we can actually help them develop their skills and achieve great things on a global scale. Because for me as an immigrant, that's what Sweden stands for. So I've just given you a quick selection there of, of some of the areas that we're focused on. And you know, take from it as you want. We're, we're currently rolling out our, our Sweden Talent Foundation uh, website where we're going to put the, the manifesto and other things up there. And we launched this project. You can almost say we launched it 30 years ago because Lars Henrik and, and Boris have been working on, on talent issues for the last 30 years. But this project specifically, the Sweden Talent Foundation, we launched it at the World Expo 2020 in Dubai just in December with uh, the King of Sweden, um, Jacob and uh, Marcus Fallenberg and, and the ministers and others like that. So we are small, 
but we are nurturing and we're growing. And we would like to help all of you and call on all of you to sort of lean in on us and see what we can do to enable your organizations to ensure that you have AI talent based on the know-how that we have garnered over the past 30 years. And at the same time, what can you, how can you reach out to help us achieve those, those goals across lobbying and, and, and other things like that? Because we're, we're humbly coming here and we, we want to help and be helped. And this is something I want to get across again, as an immigrant in your society, people have a lot of fear around just even the term AI. People's, there's people whose mind automatically goes off to Terminator 2 and they think we're doomed. And, and that's because there's a genuine distrust around what America and China and others could end up doing with AI if it gets into the wrong hands with the wrong motivation. But I'm so happy to be on this call today because Sweden is the country that give the world the, the seatbelt. And by giving the world, designing it, creating it, and then giving it away for free, they have saved hundreds of millions of lives. Sweden is a responsible nation. And it, across the world, it actually gives off the, the sense of this is a place where the adults are in charge and they have a big picture perspective. So when I see the word Sweden beside the word AI, it brings a lot of um, calm and it, it will do that around the world. The reason why I'm telling you this on a talent call is because there's going to be a lot of talented individuals sitting around the world who are thinking, I really love AI, but I don't want to work for a team or an organization or a nation, which is going to end up ruining everything. So we really need the Swedes to start banging that drum and putting out there that this is a nation that's open to having these people come into Swedish organizations, working with AI Sweden and ac across the, the umbrella of what falls under that. To, to face the storm and, and go together hand in hand because Sweden and AI are a good fit and it's actually what the, what the world needs right now. And the reason why we need it is because we want to ensure that the world that the next generation looks in on is a world which actually lights up for them and makes them want to be involved in it, particularly young women from around the world because this is vital to, to, to our global success. And I want Sweden to be at the helm of that because uh, as we know, times are changing and we don't know where we're going to be in, in two years on a global scale or even two months, the way things have been going. So let's work together. Let's see what, what solutions we can come up with as a society. And there's definitely going to be great overlaps on what many of the people on this, this meeting are doing. And as, a, as an Irish immigrant coming into your brilliant society and been welcomed so much. This is my small offering to all of you. And I hope that some of the things I have said have resonated with you. And please reach out to me on social media. I'm most active on probably LinkedIn and Instagram and find me at Patrick Hamilton Walsh or reach out through our website at SwedishTalentFoundation.org. And I will be happy to set up meetings and connect with you all then. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patrick. I love that you're selling Sweden to Swedes. I love that aspect. And I'm sure we are going to have a very uh, interesting discussion in the panel. But now moving on to the next uh, speaker, we have Marcus Åberg, that is a people plan specialist at Academic Work uh, and works as a strategic advisor and helping companies to uh, identify and realize the future of talent. Please, Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to be here. And thank you, Patrick. That was great. Uh, I couldn't agree more with what you said. And uh, I thought I'd just pick up on that where you left off on the times are changing. Um, but before that, my name is Marcus. I work as I uh, just mentioned. I help the companies figure out where, where do we need to, need to be tomorrow. And in order to really figure that out, we need to also realize where are we today? So I thought I'd talk a bit about what does the talent market actually look like right now? And uh, what kind of challenges is it that we actually need to face? I'm going to address some of those and maybe give you some, some answers to that. Hopefully this presentation mode works. Um, speaking about how quickly the pace of change is increasing, um, we've seen the talent gap that's been, been a context that we've been talking about for, for 
well over 10 years, uh, talking about people need to learn new skills. There are still unemployed people over here, and then we have a skills shortage over here. So we need to retrain people. McKinsey did a huge study on this um, going into 2020 when they saw that there are so many jobs that are going to disappear and people are going to have to retrain to different skills. So they put out a big report looking at some of the world's largest econ economies, hundreds of millions of people they found were going to have to switch jobs in just the next 10 years before 2030. And then the pandemic hit two months after they released that report. So obviously they had to go back and look at how does this change things? And one year later, they republished a new version of that report saying, actually that high pace of change that we talked about, tune that up another 25%. So we press the gas on how quickly the world is changing in terms of jobs that are changing and disappearing and new skills being needed by a quarter. That's just one of the early impacts of this pandemic. I think we haven't really seen the full full impact of it yet, but this really accelerates something that we've, we have at Academic Work have been seeing for a long time, that we need to maybe rethink what are the actual skills that we need tomorrow. And uh, Deloitte actually agrees with us. Um, in their latest report, they said that we need to fundamentally question, you know, is it, is it the right way to find skills just by going for, from, from, you know, only looking at the people who have five years of university education, and then also they need five years of experience on top of that, maybe we need to rethink, you know, what are we hiring for? Are we hiring for what's on the CV right now? Because that's gonna be relevant in just a couple of years. Maybe we need to find the right people to hire instead long-term, and maybe we need to be better at training them. Uh, as I mentioned, this is something we at Academic Work have been talking about for years and years, but we're see seeing more and more companies being open to that, and that is simply because they have to. Uh, the latest report from Science Science Leave just came out uh, this fall. We see that the vast majority of Swedish companies in all industries are struggling to find people. They're struggling to hire. Um, and this has been true for quite some time. And some people thought that, well, maybe the silver lining of this pandemic and people losing their jobs is that maybe we'll find, you know, accessible talent. And that was true for about a month, like May in 2020. And then it started becoming difficult to hire again. And actually where we are right now and where we have been for the past six months is somewhere around here. These are just some of the headlines that we've been seeing in the past few months. The skills shortage in Sweden is so bad, but it's actually even worse in the other Northern European country, countries. And looking globally, this is, this is pretty much what it looks like. In the US, they talk about the great resignation, the, the, the big quit. And that's something that we're seeing coming over to Europe and, and Sweden as well. A lot of people coming back from the pandemic, everybody's hiring all of a sudden. I'm getting more and more job offers. And now my old manager wants me to come back to the office. I don't think so. I have five years job offers right over here. So I will just go someplace else. And this is just the latest version of what's been true for the past 10 years or so. Um, I, I did this, uh, I, I, I talked about this at a workshop I did with, with a few managers in the IT industry a couple of months ago. And uh, most of them, you know, they felt a little uneasy. Like, this is not great news. We're, we want to hire, it's so difficult to hire. And you're telling us me it's going to be more difficult in the future. Uh, but there was one manager who actually was kind of smiling and didn't look as worried as, the rest of them. So we had, I had to address this. Say, what's what? Like, you don't look as worried about this. What, what's your take on it? And he said, "Well, it's actually pretty nice to hear that this is the market that looks like this." Because I, for a minute, thought maybe it's just our recruiters who are terrible. But it's not that. It's not that your recruiters can't, can't find talent and looking for AI talent. It's it's the same thing, and it's it's AI talent and the most niche tech talent, it's the same thing. Everybody wants to find them and nobody can find them. Um, so I thought I'd address why I think this is. Why is this so difficult? And going on both looking at you know, statistics, but also from personal experience. For the last 
I mean, I've been working with the recruitment industry since 2008 and, and looking back 10 years or so or 15 years, we, we saw that the ones who were hiring tech talent, the latest technology ta talent back then, that were the IT consulting companies, the big tech companies, and the really huge corporations. But what we've seen now, and especially when I've been working so closely with companies and top management in the last few years, helping them figure out what are really the, the skills that we're gonna need tomorrow, two or three years from now. And what I see popping up, not just, I'm working with IT consulting companies too. And yeah, they, they want these things like AI and, and, and machine learning and all that, those things. But those things also pop up in real estate developers, food distribution companies, everybody all of a sudden needs that talent because they understand that these are the kinds of things that are changing our business fundamentally. And we cannot afford the risk of having that outside of our organization. We need that in-house. More and more companies are insourcing talent. And also, as, as we mentioned previously, what is AI talent? It's not just engineering and tech, it's everywhere. So that's really what it's about. And so this is what it comes down to. Everybody needs the same people. It's pretty nice now actually to be graduating with a degree, master's degree in artificial, artificial intelligence. You have options. And that is something that I am brought to a lot of corporate meetings to explain that they have a lot of options. You have to be an attractive employer because, and it's not because you know, Gen Zers or millennials are picky and they're spoiled. They might be, but that's not why. The reason why they're picky is because they can, because that's what the market looks like. now. If you have five or 10 job offers, it would be weird if you're not picky. Of course, you're gonna choose the one that has most to offer for you. So for the past seven years, we've been doing a survey together with Kantar CFO, trying to figure out what are the things that you know, makes the biggest difference? What are the things that, that they're actually looking for? And uh, I can't go through all that because that takes 90 minutes, but I'm gonna pick out a few things that I saw that were very interesting. Uh, and the full report is available on wifi.se. Um, but if you just look at tech talent in IT and looking at where do they want to work, if they, name in free text the companies where they want to work for and then they vote on who are the most sought after ones. We see it's these companies. They pop up in the top 10. What's that about? Volvo trucks, Volvo cars, Polestar and Tesla. All of them are in the top 10 for IT. Not for you know vehicle engineering, but for IT and especially, I mean, look at all these companies, you can see the impact in real life. Down here, down the street, is a car that has that technology in it, and I could be working with that. Last night, my car downloaded a new update with new AI algorithms. That is so cool. I want to work with that. It's tangible. You can see it's so easy to understand. If I come in here and I, I'm fantastic at my job, the world changes this way. It's so easy to understand the purpose. What purpose do I fill in? Rather than going into some vague organization that does some major thing and I'm in a little department here and I'm going to figure out AI for them. You know, what does that even mean? So having a clear purpose of if I come in here and do something, what, what does that change? But this also opens up, opens up some opportunities because it's not just the cool big tech companies that are already great at AI. Most companies are not that great. I mean, most are still figuring a lot of this out. So one thing that I think is fantastic is this opens up a lot of opportunity for the public sector. Um, looking at, for example, Region Ostiatlan had a lot of interest uh, opening up for, for, for studies in AI in healthcare. And all these things, I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, examples, but there's even more opportunity here. So I think this is really something where, I mean, public sector is, in general, struggling to find talent. But I think within AI, this is a fantastic opportunity. Actually. Um, another thing that they are really valuing when they look for the next employer is a place where I can find diversity. But 
it's sure about representation, seeing you know people who look different. That's one thing, and and that's something that HR usually measures because that's easy. But what they're really looking for, and what the science tells them that is the, the good thing about having diversity, is cognitive diversity. How do we find people who think different than me? How do I get to work in a place where they figured out that if we are different and think different, we don't fall into the traps of bad AI. We, I mean, there are a lot of examples of people who know a lot, a lot more than me, but just for my field of recruiting, recruiting, there's a famous story from Amazon where they put in all the data from uh, how they had selected candidates to, to hire or, or, or to bring to an interview and said, like, this, these are the decisions we made so far, just learn from that and then filter through all these applications. And what they saw that this AI learned was, okay, well, we'll not hire women, obviously, and no immigrants. And they'll say, well, okay, maybe that's not what we should be taking away. Maybe if we develop AI with more perspectives to start with, we have a better AI system. And so diversity is, is as a form of attraction in how you actually work with it is even more important when you're looking for AI skills. Um, and really, Cognitive diversity is something that, I mean, I think the science is pretty clear, but just to just as a reminder, maybe the solution to finding AI talent isn't to be so honed in on that we need somebody who has a doctorate or PhD or, or at least the very lowest a master's degree in AI in computer science. That's what we see when we meet with our clients. There's a lot of companies hiring for AI. And we try to tell them, you know, maybe you should challenge yourselves a little bit. So I think, just to sum this up, what we can learn from, from history and, and what was happening in other, other fields, and what's really, I think, the only way forward, if we're going to solve this puzzle, is to learn to be the competitive edge, to take the competitive edge over our uh, competition because everybody is looking for the same people. You can be the ones asking for, you know, the doctors and the PhDs and, and the masters and, you know, never being able to reach our headcount. Or you can be one of the ones who figure out that maybe we should learn to train new skills. Maybe we should learn to hire junior talent and have them learn on the job. The the rate at which, which you can, better than your competition, take in junior talent now is going to make a huge difference three years from now. Because three years from now, your competition is going to look for talent with three years of experience. And you will too. But if you hire them today, you have already solved that. And I mean, this is true for, for every industry, but especially in something as nice as, uh, and as competitive as AI. It's really about how can we look at the people that we already have if we are a big organization? Do we have people who want to keep working here and who have the capacity to work with this? Can we train them? Can we upskill them so that they can work with AI within our organization? Or can we bring in people from somewhere else who does not work in AI, but we can reskill them and retrain them into being able to come into a team and work with AI? This is something that we at Academic Work and, and Academy uh, do when we have a collaboration with AI Sweden. I think we will get back to that. Um, so, but this is what we learn from uh, through our, all our years. And this is, I think, what I need more employers to hear and figure this out. But I think that's my time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus, uh, for bringing in fresh perspectives in this discussion. There were several new uh, uh, concepts you brought in there, and I hope we have a possibility to come back to those. Now going into a, a panel discussion again. So let me introduce to you a few new panelists here. Or would you, uh, Ivana, start? Sure. So we would so. like to welcome Cecilia Hahnberg. Uh, she is a strategist life science at AI at Salgrenska University Hospital. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you. And we'd like to introduce uh, Boris Nordenström somewhere here. Uh, I hope you're here, Boris. I've seen you in the chat. So uh, you're founder of the uh, organization uh, Great People Application. 
Welcome, Boris. I am here. Yes. Great to be here. Great. And then we have also Anna Volby, that is the founder of We Exist. Welcome to you all. Thank you. So, uh, if I may start. Yeah, sure. Go I'd ahead. like to address a question to Anna. We have heard during the day here that uh, it's about uh, young people, it's about the SMEs and the entrepreneurs. Uh, where we need to work and put efforts. We have heard it's about international talents uh, and we have heard about women, uh, bring in young women, uh, said Patrick. So uh, Anna, uh, I know you work a lot with these perspectives in your organization. Uh, so how do you work with uh, the attraction of female talents? Yes, thank you for the question. So yes, um, We Exist is a recruitment and equality company that help uh, companies become more diverse and bringing more women and non-binary to the team. And I can agree with both many of the things we heard uh, during the last 30 minutes, um, focusing on the women, but also the international talent that we have. For example, an example that I, I like to, to share with you is um, let's say there's uh, a woman from India, her husband got a job at Volvo, uh, and even though they've been living in Sweden for three years, she hasn't got a job, and she's a full stack developer. Um, how can this be? And this is what we're trying to look at now. We have a, a product where we are aiming at these kind of women with a non-Swedish background who are in Sweden, they are looking for the first chance, someone to open the door for them. And that's what we want to do. And I think it's so important that more of us uh, try to, to open our eyes and open doors for them. Uh, and also one of the last um, comments um, was about how we can focus on the, the junior talents. And I think that's also very important because we see now from the universities, there are a lot of classes that are 50-50 men and women, but still more men than women. Uh, get jobs. How can this be? And also wanting to focus on the juniors, uh, how we can bring them in early, uh, teach them, train them, uh, upskill them, so we have this competitive advantage. So those are two major things that I think will be the, the big difference for the future. And those are the companies that will survive. Yeah, very good perspective. Do, do we have a Patrick in the panel as, of, as well? Yes, I hope so. Yes, Patrick, uh, welcome back to the panel. We can't see you, but when you are ready, uh, turn off the camera and join. Hi, there you are. Hi, nice to have you with us. So I have a question for uh, Boris. What is talent uh, in your perspective and how do we measure talent? Oh, well, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I had a bit of a sound issue here before. Uh, talent, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's been brought up a couple of times, and I think it was uh, Marcus who said it here before that, that you know this war for talent has been around for ten years. <laughs> the the war for talent expression actually comes from McKinsey. Uh, it came from McKinsey report. Uh, it's from 1997. That's 25 years ago. And already then they had realized that we no longer live in a world where employers are at power. We're moving fast ahead into a world where it will be the employee or the talent that is at power. And we obviously see that now at full strength and, and uh, even stronger now after COVID, it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy how many companies come out of this completely unprepared. Uh, so talent is obviously, it's a very wide expression. Patrick had a definition, I think in his uh, presentation from the Oxford, uh, but I think that, you know, uh, there, there's two views on this. Either it is something that you're born with and that you then expand on, uh, you know, such as some sports starts. It's really hard to become a world leader athlete until you have, unless you have the genes. And then there's the other view, obviously. It's just a question of how much uh, you've been trained and whether you've received uh, the right training. Uh, myself, I'm somewhere in between. I think there is a certain predisposition and skills uh, and uh, for today, I, I would say that uh, mathematics, uh, a certain predisposition for, for thinking in a mathematical way, in a logical way, that's a great predisposition to get into AI. 
but there's definitely a lot that can be done with training and we heard some of that earlier. I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Boris. Now to bring in Cecilia as well. I'm glad to hear Marcus talking about uh, Region Östergötland and you represent the healthcare system and you're actually working a lot with AI. Uh, so how do you work to bring in talent in your uh, organization, Cecilia? Well, at, at Solvenska University Hospital, um, of course, we, we try to stay true to our core, which is to provide excellent health care to our patients. Um, and um, when attracting AI talents, uh, we then communicate the role of AI and, and the role of AI talents in that context. Um, so we we um, showcase the different kinds of AI applications within healthcare and and, and tell potential uh, talents about the role they can play together with physicians and and other professions um, to improve healthcare for benefit for patients and and society. Um, and as well, we, we believe in uh, joining forces with others to attract talent. We have been um, part of uh, the program I for AI to co-create career opportunities within AI in Gothenburg and Western Sweden. So those are two, two ways to, to attract AI talent to Salgaska. Yes, thank you, Cecilia. And we are very happy to have that program with you. I have a question for Patrick. There was a comment in the chat. Uh, Sweden Immigration Agency rules encourages international students to leave Sweden by their hard rules on giving per permanent um, residency. residency. What, are, what is your comment here and are you addressing this uh, issue? Yeah, that, I'm so happy someone brought that up. Competency listening is something which has been really, it's been really hard on, on uh, employers within Sweden, because not only has individuals of high profile cases actually been pushed out of the society, but it also pits a nervousness within uh, other employers when it comes to actually should they go out there and sort of attract these international rock stars into their organizations. So it's true. I actually have to go back to what Marcus said as well. I, I think there's two approaches to this. We do need to attract those rock star talents from around the world to come in. But there's also, don't forget Sweden as a society which has got so many great people within it already. And that reskilling and upskilling perspective is also a core part of what we need to do. There's a lot of people sitting out in Ericsson who were rock stars in the 1980s when they came out of uh, Katie Ho and wherever else. And they've sort of just been stuck working on radio or 2G or whatever. Get those people reskilled, get them upskilled, get them working on 6G, get them working on AI. These people are smart. And um, they, are, they are in our societies. They're happy to be here. They're happy to stay. And we let's make them the new rock stars as well. So we are working on the lobbying element and understanding the, the, the core reason why we need to um, bring in talent. But at the same time, we're also focused on the fact that talent Sweden is a fantastic society with a lot of its own talent. And we need to work in, in both ways with, in that regard. Thank you, Patrick. We have another question in the uh, Q&A chat. Uh, uh, it's an anonymous, anonymous attendee saying, I'm struggling to understand this subject. There are loads of qualified people looking for jobs all over the world and would love to come to Sweden or anywhere in the world. So why recruiters cannot see them? So Marcus, you talked about whose fault is this and about the recruiters. Would you like to comment on this? Yeah, and uh, we see this all the time. I mean, we're a recruiting agency and, and everybody wants to, to, you know, sometimes when you look at who they're asking for, it's just ridiculous. I mean, these people don't exist. So, I mean, I, I really feel this comment. So we, we, we struggle with this all the time and, and, and uh, try to always challenge the hiring manager, say like, what do you really need? What is the job that needs to be done? And how can we make sure that we just find a person who can do that job? And you know, after some reasoning, they usually land on, okay, yeah, we, we can do that. And when it comes to finding people who could do the job and, and when it comes to reskilling and upskilling, uh, that's very much something that, that we, we uh, look at in, in our academy when we, we see that we open it up for anybody. Anybody can apply. And then we said, you know, you need to have this, you know, degree of skill on this test and this on this test. If you can finish those tests and, and qualify, we don't care if you're 
a hairdresser or if you're a priest or uh, if you're a marine biologist and you want to go into IT and AI, we'll be happy to retrain you if you're motivated enough. Uh, and I think telling those stories uh, can get managers to open up and see that, okay, maybe I can also have one of those cool stories. I don't have to, you know, try to hire Kista Fugasang. I can maybe hire, you know, a real person that exists in the real world and that can be fantastic. So I think I think we we need to help uh, challenge managers really to 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 the kind of people that they really need. Thank you, Marcus. We see some raised hands from our panelists. Uh, Anna, do you want to go first? Actually, Boris was before me. So no, no, go oh, ahead, Anna. Sorry. Go ahead, Anna. You're much smarter. <laughs> Oh. Well, I, I just wanted to add that I'm um, I'm amazed by companies still saying that oh, we want someone who's Swedish speaking, or we want someone who knows Swedish culture. I mean, this is a mindset that we really have to get rid of. Uh, and I try to challenge them, I really do. Uh, but this is a mindset that has to go away. So that was just my, uh, yeah, my add on to this. And, and if I should, should connect to that, I think we're going to see, we already have this. I mean, Marcus sees this all the time, I'm sure. If you go and talk to uh, some of the scale ups around the Nordics or around Europe, actually, they're all hiring from everywhere. I mean, look at Klarna, look at all of these. They're hiring, and now it's all remote. So now it's like even another level. If you go into the traditional industrial players or the larger banks, et cetera, and talk to them, they still want a 34 year old male who went to kth or whatever you know it's already the disconnect is already here and we're going to see it not just in their in their people talent pools and in their in the what they're who they're hiring but we're going to see it in the results because these people are now being accessed by these other players and it's it's a global race so uh, it's awesome to watch actually <laughs> marcus please come in yeah and just to comment on that what, what you said boris in, in I think that's also one of the reasons why we see those big players who don't want to change, who always want to hire the, you know, a copy of the person who just left. Those are not the most attractive companies. People want to work at companies like Klarna and, and, and Spotify and, and or just a random startup that has fresh thinking. I used to work at a startup. We were 20 nationalities and 50, 50 people. I had never had more interesting lunch conversation. There's a there's a, something to add to that, that, you know, these old thinking companies, they need to open up to that. And, and some are starting to, but it's it's not going fast enough. Yeah, thank you. And Anna, I know that you uh, are working a lot with diversity and we heard it from Marcus' uh, presentation and, and other speakers' presentation. So how are you working with diversity and, and uh, what role do you think that will have for the future? I mean, the, the, the world is diverse, so I think we should have companies that match the society. And we started We Exist uh, as a statement to show that women and non-binary and people with a, a different like profile than what we're used to, that we do exist and that we can create those diverse companies. But also uh, the jargon, the culture, it has to change, it has to become more inclusive. So we are helping the companies to, to see this uh, through working on their employer branding to workshops about um, gender um, diversity and inclusion um, so that they can become a safe and secure and respectful company where everyone feels valued and, and happy to work. So we hope that we can change the, the tech industry. Now, Patrick, you are the immigrant here. Uh, how come Swedes are so bad in selling Sweden? as a destination? It's, there's a few things in regard to it. The first one is that this is your norm. Like you just don't realize how awesome Sweden is because you just don't really have very much reference points in, in a regard. I've been to 140 countries around the world. I've been to all seven continents. And trust me, the tunnel banner system here is amazing. Like just that alone is fantastic. So that's your first point. The second thing then is that you're actually... The anti logon element is a big part. Like Swedes don't really like to go out into the world and bang their own drum and, and, and talk, you know, about how great they are. And in a world where everyone is shouting and amplifying how great they are, people then meet Swedes. And if you just go, yeah, it's okay, it's nice, people think, well, they're, it must be really crap then if, they're, if that's their best boast. 
So I, I think one of the big parts of my role over the last few years working with talent has been trying to sell Sweden back to the Swedes, trying to get you guys to understand this place is actually fantastic and Swedes are actually great people as well. Um, and at the same time, trying to sort of bang the drum for Swedes on the international stage and go, you know, the Swedes won't tell you how great this society is. So let me tell you as somebody who has a lot of reference points how great these are. And I think it has to change. I, I think we we can't afford to play this humble brag card anymore. I, I really think if it comes down to it, let's just bring in a bunch of Irish people, let them integrate, marry Swedish guys like I did, and then go out into the world and tell everybody how great these are, because this place is fantastic, actually. Yeah, excellent. How would you sell Sweden in three words? Open, free, ambitious. Very good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Now, uh, we are on schedule if we take a break here. And we didn't take a break the, the previous hour. So uh, uh, I'd like to say a, a warm thank you to our keynotes, of course, but to the whole panel we have in front of us. So interesting to hear your perspectives on this. And this really makes me think differently than before. So thank you for that. So let's uh, uh, take a break. And we come back in uh, four or five minutes at uh, 3 o'clock. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome back again uh, after a quick break and we now uh, will enter our third block and uh, this block is about uh, creating an attractive ecosystem together 
and we've heard from the previous discussions the importance of bringing in new perspectives and to change mindsets by introducing diversity, for example, and that would create this change that is necessary to make the transformations needed. So uh, I will hope we'll uh, uh, stick to that uh, topic and uh, continue that interesting discussions. And I know that uh, several of our panelists now will be able to join into that. So uh, Ivana, would you like to present our next panel? Yes. Thank you, Niklas. So I am very happy to present uh, Jessica Öberg, CEO of Combitech, to join the panel discussion. Welcome, Jessica. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, very welcome. And then we have Marcia Farahani, who is actually a, a talent within a program that has been mentioned during the day here, mm. the i for ai program that you have been running or are currently running, Ivana. So, yes. uh, Marcia, very welcome to you. Thank yes, you very then much. We, yeah. Then we also have Matthias Bergqvist, CEO of CGIT and also founder of Human Tech Foundation that has also been involved in the program. Welcome, Matthias. Thank you very much. And finally, we're very glad uh, to have from London, uh, Max or Maximilian Kallhed, who is uh, an executive within the vocational school Hyper Island. Very welcome to you, Maximilian. All right, so uh, bringing in some questions here. Ivana, would you like to um, be first? Uh, yes, soon. I'm curious about uh, the, the perspective from inside uh, a program. Yes, so should we start with Marisi maybe I'd then? Say so. Yeah, so uh, Marisia, you are actually in one of our program, I for AI. Uh, so what is the value of being part of program like that for you? Mm, sure, I am Marzia, and uh, just briefly I moved to Sweden four years ago for higher education, computer science, and engineering field. Uh, when I heard about the I for AI, uh, basically from the Women in AI Network, I searched a lot to see that I'm really, I see myself scale to that program. Uh, I see that they are focusing to solve one of the biggest struggle, uh, which is the AI skill shortage and as well as creating opportunity and making connection between newly graduated like me with the industrial um, and then which led me actually to apply for it. So I can, hopefully I can answer your question because there are two main reasons for me that I am um, applying for this program. One of them answering my desire and the rest I will part of the biggest uh, solution that we are faced right now. Thank you very much. And we will hear um, more from you and your perspective in, in an interview later on in the program. So thank you. Now, co-creation, uh, from what we've heard, would really be that we bring in these different perspectives and work collaboratively together. So uh, Max, from your point of view, you are, um, uh, are actually a, a co-creator in a program that we have run together, AR Sweden and, and uh, Hyper Island. What's your view of co-creation and, and of diversity perspectives? No, but first of all, I think it's uh, essential to co-create uh, these training programs, especially since we come from multiple different angles. And now even, you know, Hyper Island is very, very different or has a, has a different approach to learning than many other learning institutes. And we have tried to do collaborations with KTH as well, because I think you need to have all these diverse perspectives, especially when you work within the field of AI. And I, I think, you know, what Hyper Island often brings to the table, which is not very often, you know, talked about, I think is the soft skill. Like how, what, how do you enter um, with the problem solving mindset when you go into crack a, an issue? It's not only about the hard skills, how do you, physically or how do you program this thing but how do you actually think about it? how are you critical about what you're actually trying to solve and i think 
you know, we need all these different components, the hard skills, the soft skills, and we need everything to, and, and also multiple perspectives, of course, to uh, work jointly together in order to achieve great things. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Matthias, uh, you have been part of the i for ai program as well, uh, facilitating it together with AI Sweden. What are your learnings from the program and from, from co-creation? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, a lot. Uh, the complexity uh, is the most uh, uh, important to, to, uh, to understand. Uh, we have so much uh, who has to work together uh, it's a short time when we take the, the decision to, to, to run uh, and we have to <clears throat> get all the, the talent to, to Sweden and we have discussion with the, um, the Swedish migration agency and we have to get the, uh, all the stuff uh, right with the Skatteverk yet. It's not an easy one. <laughs> and uh, everyone is want to, to stay somewhere and uh, it's it, even if you have uh, lived in in Gothenburg for your whole life it's uh, quite an, uh, a challenge to get the, the, the apartment in, in Gothenburg uh, you can imagine the the difficulties if you come in to, to Sweden from another country so uh, get all this uh, practical stuff together is, uh, is uh, the most important uh, um, yeah, thing we have learned about the whole project. The whole project. Now bringing in, uh, you, Jessica, into the discussion, uh, Combitech has taken quite uh, unusual perspectives in working with talent and we'll come back to that, but I'm more curious about uh, yourself and the, the uh, strategies that you have for collaboration and bringing in uh, new perspectives into your organization. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Absolutely. Since Computec is a, is a consultancy and, and a solution company, uh, we don't sell our own products. So, so we're really in the business for, for making our customers shine and, and be the, our customers' uh, success. So we constantly need to adapt and see what's happening in the world around us, what kind of new technologies are, are they needing in order to, to be able to, to succeed. So I think what we have been talking about today, about ecosystems and bringing different competences together in, in order to solve a, a, an, an instant of, or, or a problem that we have identified, I think that is key. And for, for Combitech and for, for my organization, I think it's, it's a lot about understanding what the problem is, the issues, and then see the complexity of it and see what all the different competences that are needed in, in order to solve it. Because it, it's not just one company anymore that can do everything. We need to come together in those kind of ecosystems or in, in challenging collaborations, but it's really, really fruitful when it works. So, so I think that is a, a key issue for us to, to bring to the table here today, I think. Yes, thank you. So we talk a lot about collaboration in this block, uh, but how is it actually made? Um, do any one of you want to highlight some examples and uh, give some best practices? Well, I can go then uh, and then please uh, add on to this. But, but I think in collaboration, I think it's a lot about trust. That is the key foundation for it because you cannot collaborate with anyone. You can't really work together if you don't trust each other. And if you're even different companies that's coming together to solve an issue, you need to make sure that you have your ducks in a row, that you have the, the, the business model there, or that you say that we will figure it out uh, as we go along, because this is a new uh, ob this is a new problem that we don't really know the whole perspective of, so we need to be open to it, but be able to trust each other and 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 have a trust in the process. I think is is key. Max, uh, you represent a, a company that is uh, noted on on the by the of change. Stock market. Uh, Stock yes. Market. Sorry. Thank you. So uh, now. Uh, when you hear the discussions here during the day, how, um, um, and we've been talking about, Marcus introduced uh, during the last session, the concept of the great resignation. And now we go into a new shift when we open up the society here in Sweden again. Is this something that scares you? And can you say, uh, how would you tackle 
uh, this new situation, not to lose your, your employees. Me? No, that was uh, directed no. to Matthias. Matthias, sorry. Right? So, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, I thought you said uh, uh, Marcus. I, I did, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> well, uh, um, I think uh, I, I think we have to um, uh, understand that we have uh, taken some steps uh, in, in this way uh, uh, during the, the corona time to uh, see that uh, we are working everywhere and we can see each other in, in the digital way. So uh, uh, that opened up uh, a, whole, uh, a whole other, a whole, a whole other uh, situation that we can uh, work together wherever we are and wherever we will uh, collaborate. Uh, that, that's one of the parts. And, and, um, uh, and it will be interesting to see how, how we, Sweden as a country can uh, live up to the to, to next generation, the uh, post-corona time uh, to um, get talent to Sweden. Uh, and I think, I think it was uh, some of the other speaker who was uh, talking about the digital visa problem and so on. I think that uh, very interesting to see how we can um, and make it easier to, to come to Sweden and work uh, for a longer short term but it's uh, right now it's, it's uh, quite a issues we have to deal with uh, directly when we, are, when we come to Sweden and work so that's that's interesting. Thank you Matthias and Maximilian what are your thoughts on this topic because I know that you're calling live from uh, London right? What is the yes. situation in the UK? I mean, it's the same thing here. I know that many of uh, my friends uh, have started to uh, at least go back to hot desking in their offices. Uh, many of the companies that they work for have decided to uh, basically go down in size. Uh, and now they have a hybrid work setting. Uh, of course, the restrictions in the UK have been fairly more severe than in Sweden. Uh, so I think everyone is just happy now to have a, a place to go, I think, but, uh, but also the distance to commute and stuff is often way longer here in London. And, and I think a hybrid workplace seems to be the, the way to move forward now. I haven't heard anyone who had any um, demands on going back to the office for five days a week uh, that uh, I haven't encountered yet, but maybe that will happen. Who knows? I think we are quick to adapt to in one way, but we're also quick to go back to how things were uh, if we need to. Marcia, you represent uh, really somehow the kind of uh, talent that we are all looking for here during the, this day and discussed so much. I would like to know what's your view and how would you look up on your future employees, uh, employers? Uh, uh, so, so how would you how would your future look like if you could wish? It's a really good question, but before I answer that, for me, the talent definition is somehow I have the competence and able to do a job and also willing to do a job and also finding a meaning and purpose when I am working with the company, yes? But the thing that's good about the talent is that uh, we are young, almost young, but we can have a different stage uh, life, I understand, but I mean, we are young, we are eager to learn, and we are so easy to adopt new approaches in the company. So I'm looking that if we are attracting the talents, not looking only to the short term relationship with them long term as well, because the benefits come to the long term relationship when you have this kind of um, it means attract and keep them as well because it's more important for me. And when I am working with the company as a talent, the first thing and or two things that I am looking for it is that I feel some sense of ownership with the company. It means um, I have a sort of skills, I come to the company, I want to work it, but at the same time, I want to feel that I am belong to that company as well and make a bond with me and as well as show me some opportunities and let me know that there is a room for me to develop and achieve in somewhere in some place in the company and uh, that 
I think that's really important for me to let me know that the career development plans that they have for me or for the talents they are already um, have their company and making possible the opportunities that are available for me to grow with that company as well. And um, the two things that I also want to add to making this process better for everyone that's looking to attract talents and keep them in the Sweden and work with the company is that when we are planning for a program uh, or graduate talent program or any program, it's really good to take a look at two things, life stage of talents, because the talents that you are attract, maybe they are between 80 to 24 and the other maybe between 28 up to 40. So they have a different desire when they are coming for this program. They have another type of plans in the future for themselves and for the companies. So it's really good to take care of that as well. And also the diversity for this program as well, I'm looking for it. I, I, I'm not only taking off the gender, or I mean, women more than the men's or now in the background, uh, the different things they may be possible and I think they will be answered the thing that Anne uh, from the first block explained about the AI demands and maybe we are going from the weak to the strong or super or general AI we need another AI demand if you are now taking off a different diversity of talents when you are attracting so maybe in the future if you something happen you need the more AI demands in different area you already have it so um that's really good because it's provide a balance of skills, uh, creativity it comes, and also the boosted business and product productivity increase. So for me, the things um, are more important when I am in the program and what the companies wants to show me is more valuable for me, the things that I mentioned right now, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have a question in the q and I, I yes. can see you don't have it on your screen, <laughs> no, Ivana. You, you so go. it says, uh, what concretely are the soft and hard skills needing for implementing AI? So that's an open question really to any of you who'd like to try to answer that question. And since I touched upon it maybe, or Jessica, do you want to go? No, yeah, sure. please go ahead, you. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I think it's, uh, I mean, of course, there are a ton of different skills uh, and and uh, things I think you should have when working with it. Of course, it depends on where you're entering and, and where you want to go with your with your business or product or project. Uh, but I definitely think to you have to have critical thinking, you know, and also a bit of design thinking as well, like understand who you're uh, creating the um the project for or the solution for uh i i think sometimes when especially when working in tech we sometimes forget who the end receiver is and what implications it might have so you know really really thinking about the end end receiver and uh, and applying design thinking when uh, creating these these products uh that and these are of course soft skills that i'm talking about now and then the hard skills i think there are other people way better equipped than myself to talk about um what kind of of hard skills a person might need to uh, pursue a career in the uh, uh, in the in the ai industry uh right now uh maybe maybe you have something jessica on, on on in that regard that you know things that you've been looking for Uh, you know, in our presentation, uh, we will get, dig into a bit of the IE, uh, but 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 not here in, in the specific. When it comes to hard facts, I'm not the right person to to answer that as well. But but I agree with you when it comes to to the soft side of it, to make make sure that the skills are used and, and understand uh, of how and when we are supposed to use it because it's so easy that ai will become just a buzzword that a lot of people are using and want to use but we don't really know how to use it so, so i think that is understood is, is important for us to understand both from a management perspective but but though, but also when we are are uh, talking about demands and, and uh, requirements in in specific projects mm. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for Jessica, if we go back to the collaboration part. So when you are looking for collaborations and partners, what are you what are you looking for and what are you looking for to achieve? 
with those partners? I'm trying to, to find partners that will uh, complement us for sure, but also that will challenge us. Uh, and 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 I often when I when I look at the partnerships that we have created, where we are part one part of of uh, the partnerships. I can see that we are arranging it in so many different segments. So I think it's important to reach outside of what you might see as your normal box. We have now ecosystems or partnerships uh, ranging from the defense sector through mining uh, into um, uh, vehicles. So, so and, and it's just to, to realize that there are so complex issues that so many different part, parties are struggling with that you can find the answer just by looking totally in another direction and see that okay here are two two segments that could come together the mining area and the defense area you might think that what's what's the similarities between them well there is pretty much a, a really really challenging environment either you are uh, developing a fighter or a submarine or you are digging your way into the, the mining in, in, in the ground. So, so, so just think, think, think outside of what you normally see as your partners, I think is a good start at least. And then trust. Right. Don't forget that because you can't reach any results if you don't trust each other. We'll get to know more about your programs, Jessica. But I'm curious, we, and it touches a question in the Q&A as well, uh, talking about, uh, about personal brands and how would you brand yourself if, if you come from a non-technical background? Because we know and we've heard today that AI covers a broad spectrum of, of skills and competences. So Max, I know you have been uh, thinking a bit about the, the gap here and what, how people should position themselves. Yeah, but I also think it's a gap from the industry and the uh, higher education here because, you know, and it also for AI Sweden, you have something called change agents. I think, the, first of all, the terminology, what do we call this, uh, this person uh, when, uh, when they graduate? What are they? Uh, because at, at Hyper Island, the program is called AI Business Consultant. It can mean a quadrillion different things. And I think same thing, change it. And it's also, it's hard to pinpoint. And then when companies are looking for these emerging talents, uh, how, how can they attract them to their companies when they have very, very niche like job descriptions that requires X amount of years of experience, et cetera. But the skills that they've been taught is a need that they currently have. But then there are like, there, there's this gap between the amount of years that might they might need in their CV or work experience from a prior yeah from a similar industry, but you know it's such a new thing. So we haven't really managed to close that gap yet. So I think it's important that you somehow and I think uh, Marcia, you or I think you were talking a little bit about it when you know I think it's important that you uh, find someone, you give someone the trust and the opportunity to go in and and show what you're good for. You don't maybe have all the requirements that's in the job description, but at least you have some training now and you are probably better equipped than most professionals out there uh, because you've been trained for this now for the past past years or so. So I think it's about, you know, meeting somewhere halfway here. We are, of course, trying to design a program that's desirable for the industry, but I think it's also important for the industry to meet and lower maybe the bar for the people that they take in, at least on paper to begin with. And then, you know, let them let them let them show how what they're good for. Thank you very much, Maximilian. Now, one more question, I think. One more question. Yes. Okay, we can do that. All right. It's do, so interesting. Do you have a question in your pocket <laughs> that you would like to? No. <laughs> um, no, I think we've uh, covered those in the Q and A. So uh, that could be an open question. Then um, mm -hmm. let's see. Or you may you raise one yourself. So please go on now we'll, when we have the pace up here. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, we'll come back to, to this uh, talent pool uh, question shortly. But talking about establishing a, an AI talent pool, uh, how could we do to work towards greater diversity, which is something we've been touching on so much today. Could you uh, give, provide some, some own experience or, or best practice or examples? 
um, maybe because I was uh, feel that maybe I can some bring some examples. Right now, I am working with us as an and I'm working with the data science and modeling team. And the team consists of 10 to 12 men and only three women. So you can see how much is not diverse. So in every people, uh, men, women, uh, in different age, or, uh, different, uh, in different area diverse, they have some experience, they have some backgrounds, they have some knowledge and they bring new ideas because if me and you and her will be the same and we discuss about something, creativity or productivity is not happen because we don't bring any new ideas. But in the diverse, in the different uh, perspective, you can bring new ideas and new project and new way to solve the problems that you want to use the AI. So uh, for me, the diverse example it consists of uh, bringing new way of thinking because different people, different background, different experience bring new way of thinking. And based on that, the project and making decision will be different. The thing that the AI is already do based on the algorithm with the thousand of data, it mimic something and bring a better de decision that you really needed in your process. So the human can also do that but taking care of the diversity and inclusive environment of the group and also let them know they can open open, uh, open, and they can speak. Um, they have this power to speak up in the team and when you're working as a team in the company. Um, this is the thing that I can example based on the experience that I had these four months working with AstraZeneca. Thank you for sharing, Marcia. Is there anyone else who wants to any last comment before we wrap up the panel? I think we could okay. just maybe go back. I think it was uh, Marcus Obe who brought that up, the, the diversity uh, part of it. And, and I think he had a point there that is valid to maybe remind our, ourselves uh, about that bringing professional backgrounds don't just uh, Put the same kind of people in the room if you're gonna even if you're gonna solve a, an, a technical solution there might come great ideas from people that is support or, or the functions within a, a, a company bring those into the table as, as well because something happens when you have that kind of a high ceiling uh, approach or, or you can you can discuss in a really um, Either way, you know that there isn't just one answer. You, you need to discuss it. You need to have different uh, professionals in, in the room. So, so use the whole company, I would say. Thank you. Matthias, you were going to say something. So final word. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I will just uh, mention uh, that uh, in uh, such an example as uh, I4AI, we, we meet each other one day a week uh, at uh, AI Sweden. Uh, that's a perfect way to collaborate uh, and uh, meet each other and uh, uh, discuss uh, our, our issues and, and uh, project we are in. And uh, we can do it uh, on several items like uh, learning Swedish or when we talked about how Swedish society works and we, we will train them in that. So uh, it starts with to know each other, then we can uh, develop the, the, the collaboration between uh, people to people. And that's a, a very important uh, part in the project of I4AI, I think. Thank you, Matthias. Any last comment, Maximilian? Oh, I think, I think, uh, I think we've covered all of it, uh, or most of it at least. But I, um, I, I really appreciate uh, all these incentives, and I, I, and I think there's been some really interesting discussions so far. Uh, I hope uh, we can, you know, bring, at, at least from my perspective, bring the next generation talent one step closer to the demands of AI or the AI industry in Sweden. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you to all panelists for contributing with your ideas and insights and now Niklas is yes, going to uh, tell so us about Yes, thank you Max and Matthias. We will hear more from uh, uh, Marcia and the I4AI program yeah. briefly but first uh, I'll just see if I can switch screen here.
There you go. So uh, we are now going into a, a, a part of this, uh, soon wrapping up this day, but the final part will be about what programs that we create and co-create within ASWIN together with all of you partners and also bringing up some new programs here. So we will come back to uh, that we are starting up and growing in the national talent pool, which is one of our, our really, really important uh, goals this year. Uh, we have the, the idea or the target that we will have at least 100 talents going through AI's, AI Sweden's uh, talent programs during 2022. And uh, we have also heard that we need to look more for international talent, obviously. So uh, that's also some, something we will address and we will come back to that. And we do have a number of talent programs already. We are working with young talents from the ABB Gymnasium. We will start a new cohort. We are working with our AI change agents, as you heard, and we have our I for AI International Graduate Program. We also have an AI Systems Engineer Program that will uh, uh, we'll ask you partners to sign up for that program. We have a master thesis program started up in Gothenburg. We will spread that nationally. And uh, uh, looking up to where we are right now, we actually have 23 talents in our programs that are currently doing internships at 11 of our partners. We have, in addition to that, uh, 28 students at 15 pro projects right now going on with nine uh, other partners actually. So this is uh, super exciting that we have come so far in less than half a year. Uh, but now we are also we are so proud to being able to introduce and launch a new program together with Combitech. So uh, Jessica, uh, please uh, take the stage and you have with you also your colleague and CTO of Combitech, Johan Gunnarsson. So please, you, can, uh, you may share your, your slides here. Thank you, and thank you so much for, for having us. Yeah, that is correct. We are launching now uh, a new program that we call AI in Mind. And uh, I will start then of giving you a brief presentation of Combitech and our experience and, and how we're using this CTP, as we call it, Combitech Talent Programs. And then Yuan will uh, dig into a little bit more about this specific program. So, so please, Yuan, next picture, which is just some quick fa facts soon uh, about Combitech, so you all know uh, who we are. Uh, we are about 2,100 employees in the Nordic area. Uh, most of us are working from Sweden, um, but uh, we are today one of the uh, largest uh, company that are providing uh, cybersecurity uh, solutions and, and uh, making sure that we can use the security heritage that we have. We are a wholly owned uh, company by Saab, the defense and security company, but we are uh, delivering our services to so many other industries and the public sector, uh, mainly in Sweden, but also in the other Nordic areas in Finland, um, Norway and, and Denmark. And you can see here, as, as I was talking about the trust and building um, ecosystems, we can see collaborations between all of these uh, different areas that you see on the right hand side of the screen that we from the mining area um, uh, to the uh, telecommunication area to defense area to vehicles and so forth so so i think the collaboration is key for us but we are always coming back to our services that we are part of and that we are bringing to the table the the roots are system development and product development. And now we're adding on a lot of competences within both communications and cybersecurity and digitalization. And the digital uh, transformation is really, really key for us now going forward. And coming back to the total defense, not just the defense, but the total defense. So for this program and for our, we can take the next slide, please. Um, we can see now how Combitech uh, the last 15 years have been working with what we call the talent program the Combitech Talent Program, where we bring in newly graduate, some um, students that comes in with new, fresh uh, technical skills. And we have this program uh, developed uh, with the, the Academica in, in Sweden. So for instance, with KTH, to make sure that we can rapid 
rapidly or even more rapidly than, than we normally do, bring these students up to speed, become even um, more, uh, more senior in a faster way by putting them together with our senior uh, consultants and in projects right away. Earlier today, we talked about the hard skills and the, and the soft skills. I can translate it into this picture where we pro talk about the professional skills, the hard skills or the technical skills, which is really, really important, but also the, the soft skills, the people skills that makes us uh, engineering that, that actually works because there is one thing of, of getting the technical skills uh, at the academic end, but then you need to be able to really use it in a good way. Use it with the legacy systems that's already there at the customers or at, with the industries or in the public to bring that all together to make sure that your, your knowledge is coming to a good use. So I think the whole development part of this to, to go from newly grad and in two years time becoming a really quick uh, a, a senior consultancy in, in a, a certain area. And we have done now this for 15 years. Uh, we have experience from almost 50 classes, 49 classes, uh, and we have passed 550 talented through this programs during the year. So I'm really super excited to start up a new program now with uh, AI focus. So please, uh, Johan, continue and dig in a little bit more about the, this program. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, great. Um, I will continue on the experience development because that is sort of the, one of the unique uh, capabilities of this uh, talent program. And uh, what we are doing is, is that we are adding to the hard skills and to the leadership skills, also the ability to, to kickstart the right uh, half brain, so to speak, where you can actually boost how quickly you get experience. And the testimonials from our customers is uh, three examples here where they claim that uh, by doing this kind of product, they, they, they build trust. You can have a better way of getting an overview. You can be more confident about the result. Uh, so you can combine the soft skills and the hard skills in a very good way. In this program, you are getting contact with the technology, of course, and, and Combitech is working with AI in many different fields. Here I just put some examples from machine vision, which is sort of nice because it's uh, make good pictures on the PowerPoint. But we are working with, for instance, in the forest industry, uh, detecting uh, uh, the, the insect infecting uh, parts of the woods in this country, very efficient. We are working on the medical center, of course, and in the number four and number eight in this picture, we are also detecting how to reuse material in the product life cycle, where we are having a big challenge in the future to be much more better to take care of all the things we are throwing away as, as consumers. On the top right side, we are also very much engaged in the automotive industry when it comes to making cars more smart in the drive, driving on the roads. So now I'm very proud to today launch what we call AI in Mind, which is a combination of the Combitech talent program with the AI Sweden capabilities. So what we are doing is that we have added on top of the company talent program, we are also adding the AI uh, project. Uh, we have combined it with the Edge Lab, with, with the AI Lab that company has, and all the different networks that, that is existing in the AI Sweden network. Um, remember that by taking, hiring a talent, to your uh, company. Now I'm addressing you as a, a company a membership in AI Sweden, particularly. Uh, you can uh, add this uh, talent into this program. The talent becomes a part of the class, building up a network, and but work full time at your problems, bringing more capabilities and more knowledge from from uh, all the different networks. And, and also work on the fact that it builds experience by actually reflecting a lot more about life and the work life, et cetera, to be much more capable and, and going forward by, by that. 
So this, I'm very looking forward for, to marry these two things together, the Competex Challenge Program and, and uh, the AI Sweden Expert uh, Network. So AI in mind. Um, the contact you can reach us is me, Johan Jonasson, the CTO. There's also John Larsson that is managing this uh, new program at AI in Sweden, and also Anders Sandlog. So here you find the contact uh, address to that. Okay, back to Niklas. Thank you so much, Johan, and thank you, Jessica. And we are really proud to collaborate on this new uh, program, and I'm excited to, uh, to see how this will uh, evolve when we can look back in a year or two. So, um, uh, are there any questions to Combitech? I think we have some room for a question or two here. I can start with a question myself. Uh, you mentioning uh, Anders Sandblad here, and I happen to know that he is quite recently, uh, what do you say in English, speak at, uh, hammered his, his uh, PhD yeah. thesis, and um, that he now is a PhD in, in uh, I'd say, uh, the interface between humans and machines from, a, from an experience, knowledge, and a perhaps philosophical perspective. So, uh, can you say something, Johan? You have obviously you are uh, investing in research in, in this area. Yes, uh, that's correct, and, and it has been a, a very interesting topic. How can uh, we make um, uh, a, a newly created talent uh, a, becoming a more mature a consultant to our customers, together with the customers, and the. Typical key is, is uh, to be able to have techniques and methods uh, that will teach us how to reflect on different problems. And, and for that kind of know-how, the methodology to do that, to actually become quicker, mature. I, I think mature is perhaps not the most, uh, uh, it is very uh, inspiring, <laughs> even though the word mature perhaps is, is uh, speaks to some, something else. But the combination of being able to understand the customer, understand the problem, to be able to use the right tool at the right time in order to actually solve the problem in a good way. Uh, that is the human skill. It would, it, I would claim that is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, a skill for the right part of the brain, uh, not particularly perhaps the left part. Uh, and that is actually uh, the right brain will be kicked start uh, with this kind of methodology, which makes the, the human perspective very, very centric in this way. So, so this is a very interesting methodology. Yes, thank you very much. So we have a question uh, in the Q&A. How to describe AI competencies and experience on CV or LinkedIn? Do you have any best practices? Good question. Uh, we are we are a company that works a lot with CVs, of course, uh, being consulting companies, and uh, of course you uh, uh, in in uh, in our company, I, I think the CVs are are typically also focused not only with the technology part, um, uh, but also what kind of projects do you have experience with. What kind of solutions have you been part of, and so on? So, so being able to show and prove prove that you have actually solved and a problem, and being a member of a team uh, from its start to the beginning, and being proud not just because that it was AI, but actually you created not only a cornerstone, but you created a cathedral. That's a, a good way to think about the CV. All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Johan and Jessica. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, see more of you and your and this program. And I know you also have a workshop coming up, and we'll we'll uh, invite our partners for that workshop just later on in a second. But first, we'll listen more to Ivana and to Marcia, who yes. will be bring back into the panel. Exactly. So. Uh, 
you will talk about the program I for AI. Yes, but before I do that, I'll answer another question in the uh, Q&A. There is a question, is there any consorti consortium work on AI landscape in Sweden aiming at showing which companies are doing that, uh, are working on AI? And my advice here is we uh, at AI Sweden have created a startup landscape and you can see that uh, what startups we have in Sweden that are working on AI and we have also developed uh, startup AI landscape for more countries. So check that out. I'm sure Ingrid can help us with a link in the chat. But regarding other or traditional companies, uh, you can check our, out our partners. Our partners are working with AI, obviously. And do you have any other advice where people can find which companies are working with AI? I think I'll come back to that. So okay, yes. you'll come back to that. <laughs> All right, cliffhanger. Great, I love it. All right, so I would like to uh, invite back Marzia to this panel and uh, talk about the program I for AI. So I will give you first the background and tell you a little bit more about the program. And then Marzia will share her experience being six months plus in the program. So AI for AI was an initiative with, together with our partners, AI Sweden and AstraZeneca and Sensact. We talked about the, the talent shortage and that we would like to create a talent uh, program to attract international AI talents. And shortly after that, we got also Sahlgrenska University Hospital on board and created the first um, uh, cohort and the first pilot program. And the program is uh, targeting international AI talents. It's a program for 18 months where talents come to Sweden. They work at three these three organizations. They get to work uh, on very exciting AI projects and be integrated into their core companies. And we really think that there is um, um, strength with having a rotating program where talents can rotate between the companies because then they bring their AI skills, but they also bring other knowledge and experience from these other companies. And we believe that that is the right way to straighten the ecosystem and to share and rent or borrow knowledge and resources from each other. So yeah, and then um, we have heard also Matthias mentioned that one day a week, uh, the talents spend at AI Sweden, where we really boost them with the best that AI Sweden can offer. They get to tap into our ecosystem, get to know uh, people, they can do projects in the Edge Lab, they learn about leadership and AI transformation and, and much, much more the layer Swedish language. So we really believe that we can build this platform for AI talents to spring off and then be of value to our partners. So yeah, and we had a pilot project, a pilot program last year, and we are now opening to take in new partners that want to be in this next cohort. So don't miss this opportunity, and there will be a sign up link for you to, to sign up if you're interested to hear more shortly. But now over to Marcia. Hi, Marcia. Hi. So happy to have you here. So you are one of uh, four uh, talents that we have in i for ai So where did you find out about the program and, and why did you apply? Uh, I think I answered this question in the last uh, discussion that we already have, but uh, I found this program through the Women in AI Network because I hugely support women in AI field and I am really passionate that they are deserved to be in this category and work. And uh, so through the Women in AI Network, I find the advertisement of i for ai program. And then I start searching about it and see that it really fit me and they answer my desire. So finally I found it very, uh, really interesting and I apply for this. But uh, I think it's a time for me to a little bit talk about that uh, i for ai program as a case to bring up a good talent attraction plan and the possibility to make it even better for the rest people that are joining uh, this event. Uh, 
Matthias and the rest of AI Sweden has an amazing job and the program has a different factors that attract the talents like me. First of all, they offer the standout benefits because benefit for me is a good way to ensure that you can attract the best talents. And during this program, you will experience the values lead working environments and the standout salary. And the second one, they offer professional development uh, opportunities, even in your personal and professional growth that uh, Ivana mentioned, like AI transformation, different sources, collaboration, different projects, and even training the Swedish and help you to have this effort to come up with the Swedish culture and have this bond with the Sweden as a country or second how. And the third one is they create this um, program with the well-defined company brands because if you want to attract talents around the world and it will require a very strong company identity and you can see this uh, program built on organization like AstraZeneca, Zensiak and Salgenska University Hospital that I'm really, really um, amazed and I have a, such a great time learning process and also bring some new things in the table in different uh, rotation but right now I am in the first rotation of AstraZeneca so the program is still ongoing for me and also it's really good to mention that Matthias as a manager of AI student and I for AI program uh, did amazing job because uh, the talents that we are coming to Sweden in initial months, maybe we feel lonely or difficult to navigate, but I see the people in AI Sweden as a colleague, uh, they help us in this process and we feel like uh, the Gotham Bay is like a second home for us and we don't uh, feel that much difficulty. And the onboarding is really, really easy for this uh, program. And I'm really happy about that. And accommodation as the Matthias said, he bring uh, as an alternative for having the house in a best level. Um, and you can feel that because the thing important accommodation, you're backing from home, you want to rest, and this is the main basic thing that you want to have in a good level. And uh, the accommodation here it was easy and I really enjoy it. So um, I hope that I answer, I bring some insight about this I for AI program and what, what I think and I believe they are a good, amazing job about that. Yes, definitely. Thank you for sharing. And um, I have a question. Uh, so if you just saw an ad for uh, Salgrenska uh, or Sensac, would you apply? And would that be as appealing as a program where you rotate between different com companies and different industries? Mm. Actually, I was in the phase for applying for a job because I finished uh, my education and I'm ready to apply for the jobs. Uh, actually, yes, I will be applying for if they were individual companies. But the thing that this program that has uh, fascinated me and pursued me to apply for it, it was you have this opportunity to have three uh, experience and AI case uses in different sectors like healthcare and one of them is the NCIG in a computer in a, in the um, uh, mobility of the cars and uh, you have the chance to understand what type you want to build in your career you want to you have this chance to experiment a little bit and find your um, interest in AI field and build a career on that top so I will say that that's the main reason I'm really uh, apply for this program because you have the chance to experience a lot and learn a lot in the process and um, but if it was an individual like Salgenska or Zensiak or AstraZeneca, yes, I will apply for that. But they have something represent more that was the experience in 18 months. And then you find your interests and you can build a career ba based on your interest field that you're using AI. So that's, that's, the, main, uh, that's the main thing that um, I'm really happy about this program they give you a different chance of experience. Excellent, thank you. And um, also um, the program is in Sweden. Was that attracted, attractive to you? Mm, yes, because I, I think I moved in Sweden four years ago for the education, but I am a type of girl that I always mm, search for my plans that I can say Sweden is 
have four things in my mind that I really like it is that it's an innovative and creative uh, country. And then you have a high quality of education and you have the work opportunity. But right now, maybe it's a little bit hard because uh, I don't I don't see we have a, that much lackage of AI skills, but I don't know what's the problem between the hiring system uh, and um, but I, say, I, I believe that so there is a working opportunity a lot. And the main thing, you have a work-life balance in this country that I really like and enjoy it. So that's why I decided to um, be in Sweden um, because they answer the things that I'm looking forward to live in a country. That's these four things that I mentioned to you because when I started, little job of mine. I started with Ominova Innovation Incubator and I start my practical side with one of these uh, innovation companies and that helped me to understand is now a time for me to join the industrial. So that's, you have a different ways to join and use your innovation and creativity in this, com uh, in this country that I really like and enjoy. Thank you very much, Marcia. I think that's it uh, for if we look at the time. Yes. I would just l uh, like to add that Marcia is right now uh, working as a data scientist at, at AstraZeneca. And uh, we have also had collaboration with Women in AI and Human Tech Foundation of creating i for ai program. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Marcia, for Thank your you very much. sharing your passion about AI and uh, your ca future career. So now we are ending up this day and we have two more things that we would like to present for you. So Peter Kosvelli coming in from backstage. <laughs> from the uh, sidelines. Please. What an interesting day, I have to say. There's a, so many things to talk about. There's really clear that this is an issue we need to address and that Swedish companies need to work a lot harder with AI talent, it's especially talking about what's happening in Canada and Quebec, where I'm normally based, but also what we hear from academic work, we'll hear from Patrick that we need to be more proud and that we need to move faster in the, the urgency, the sense of urgency in the war for talent. Uh, so one of the things we want to do there is to release what we're releasing here today. Because uh, everything we do, we do uh, because we want to accelerate the use of AI in the Swedish AI ecosystem. We want to accelerate it to benefit society and our industrial companies and our partners. And we do this through people. Even though AI is a very technological term, the way to accelerate it is through people. And uh, we are here for our partners. Everything we do and everything we try to develop is for our partners to really take advantage of and use in their acceleration of AI. Uh, so what we want to address now, and I brought one of my, my closest colleagues here also to talk about the development stage, but talking about AI talent and, and AI competence, really getting it in there so that co uh, companies and organizations can, can learn how to use AI to, to really accelerate their competitiveness. Uh, we have three ways uh, where, where competence can attract or where uh, companies can attract and acquire competence. And that is really the acquire stage, what we he heard a lot about today, the talent programs, the internships, the master thesis, how you get in, in competence. But then we also have recruitment external recruitment, getting in people from outside of your organization. And then we of course have developed what we heard earlier about today uh, regarding upskilling and reskilling uh, of employees. And, and Raquel, um, my closest colleague here, will talk about that. And then also the buy stage where we have the consultancy companies we have in our partner networks represented. Uh, we have partnerships where you have mergers, for example. But first, what we want to produce is what we're uh, releasing uh, now and, and in the coming uh, weeks here is our job board. And we got a lot of questions around that also in the chat and in the Q&A session. And it's really our way of, of helping our partners building a national talent pool, making it easier for international talent to find potential openings in Sweden. Uh, just as we said, 
I for AI, the AI for AI talent is an excellent uh, example for how we can collaborate. But we know that there's a lot of other interesting roles out there at our partners. So those will be uh, posted soon here. And if you're already curious to join the national talent pool, uh, you can use the connect, you can go to careers.ai.se, use the connect stage and it choose either uh, AI Sweden if you're interested in a role at AI Sweden or uh, jobs at our partners if you're interested in that or all. Uh, then you will be notified of uh, the present and the future jobs posted. Uh, as of now and what we're working on, right now there's uh, only uh, op open positions at AI Sweden. Uh, there will be openings at our partners in the coming weeks, uh, definitely, because we are releasing this right now. And if you have any questions, you can just reach out to me uh, on my email or on LinkedIn or here in the chat um, to just connect and uh, so we can use the job board. Because uh, this is really our way of promoting the uh, AI ecosystem here in Sweden. Uh, and with that said, I want to go over to Raquel uh, in Gothenburg, um, talking about developing AI competence and what we're doing at that stage right now. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, my name is Raquel Sanchez, as Peter said, and I'm head of training at AI Sweden. Uh, so I would like to share uh, my screen. Um, Niklas, could you? All right. I'll stop sharing, please. Great, go ahead. thank you so much. Uh, so, and, and thank you so much, Peter, for reminding us why we are doing this because it's so so important that this is for accelerating the use of AI in Sweden for the benefit of our society, but also the competitiveness. So, what we um, uh, at AI Transformation uh, try to work with is quite a, a, a lot around this um, model, mental model about, you know, creating an AI vision connected to the overall objectives that the organization has that will guide us in the use cases that we choose and what enablers that we need to continue to build on. And one of these enablers is, of course, the competence part, the expertise part. And, and we need to look at it, as you also mentioned, Peter, from a and at other angle, we need to kind of raise our view a little bit and talk about the competence strategy, because I think that all of these pieces uh, really come together and help out uh, uh, in the organizations to achieve their goals. So as you mentioned, uh, we have a lot of around acquiring, we have the fantastic talent programs, uh, we have also the development part where we really believe that we need to develop people already working in the organizations. We need to create situations where uh, learning on the job can actually happen. So, so what we are doing now is that we have created an AI core training uh, and we have this new concept that I would like to go through with you guys that we call the learning lab. So uh, the learning lab is actually kind of a mindset where we try to uh, um, create uh, um, an area for all of our partners to actually come in and collaborate, co-create different types of competence activities. And one crucial group in this uh, competence lab or a learning lab is actually the competence strategy forum. So this competence strategy forum is actually a group of people that will from learning from an external overview, because there is, is no a secret that uh, there are some companies already ahead of us, uh, some countries that are uh, been doing this for, for more years than we have. We need to learn from that. And with those insights, we need to start collaborating, co-creating and actually taking action. And all of these actions we would really like to see in our learning lab. And of course, this is to serve the AI ecosystem. So uh, what we are looking for here now is that to build this group of people belonging both from the private and public sector who works with competence at the strategy level. And that's why we are looking for maybe executives or directors working with this area and also have the ma mandate to kind of drive these competence development activities 
but who also has this collaborative mindset because it's kind of a new way of thinking that we cannot create everything together. We have different strengths. So let's use all of those strengths to, to achieve what we need to achieve. And we will do this, of course, uh, by nominations. So if someone feels that, yes, this is something for me, please don't hesitate to contact us. So that's really all from me. Uh, this has uh, gone a little bit fast, I know, but uh, it's uh, the time I think is chasing us a little bit. But please do not hesitate to contact either me or Peter in this. Sorry. There's my name. Thank you, Raquel. Now, if you let me share this final screen, uh, we'll wrap up this day. And uh, we had a cliffhanger earlier on about where do you find companies? And really, I think, Peter, you were answering part of that question through our your board, of course. We also had in the chat that we have a, the Swedish AI landscape mapping, which is also a great community where you can find AI companies. And then, of course, we have the own community within AI Sweden that you showed, Peter. So. Uh, I'd like to uh, address a great thank you to all of you uh, taking part of this day today and uh, end with this slide uh, saying that there are now an opportunity for all you partners out there to uh, actually co-create our future talent programs together with AI Sweden. So we'll post these opportunities in the chat, uh, but there is now time to sign up for for example, the new program AI in Mind, for the AI Systems Engineer program, for the AI for AI program, mm -hmm. and there is also soon time to sign up or add ads into the job board. And there are also a possibility to take part in a workshop together with Combitech to co-create their future programs. So these are examples, and of not least, of course, what Raquel mentioned, bringing in your nominates in the new competence strategy for. So, thank you, Ivana. Would you like to say a final word to end up this day? Yeah. Hasn't it been fantastic? I, I don't think I, I can have, <laughs> I can express uh, as much as, as we have shared and experienced this uh, afternoon. I think it has been fantastic and thank you to all the keynote speakers for your views. Thank you for all the panelists for raising your your voice and uh, highlighting different perspectives, uh, um, introducing new concepts. Um, yeah, I think it has been a um, fantastic afternoon and I really hope that we, can, we have inspired our partners. I hope that you engage with us and, and other uh, players in the market so that we can collaborate and co-create and uh, yeah, really put Sweden uh, on the map as an AI destination. Thank you. With those words, thank you.